uh, let me say a couple of words um, before we start. So welcome everyone first. Um, this is gonna be the first session of uh, the dynamic matching and queuing workshop. So Yonku and I are delighted to have this first version and, and to have this program uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, both of us were actually pretty impressed by the number of people who eventually registered. It's uh, 220 uh, according to the last uh, few years. We're thinking about uh, alternating uh, this between Paris School of Economics and Columbia and to make this um, a yearly event uh, broadly related to market design and matching. Um, just a couple of, of additional words. Uh, so we'll have four talks today, four talks tomorrow, and 15 minute break after the second talk uh, on each day. We'll have a social gathering at the end of each day where um, so people can gather and chat. We very much hope that you will be joining. It's uh, at the very end of the first talk, so like 1.15 New York time. Um, in terms of organization, so we thought that, uh, so each speaker is gonna have 55 minutes. At the end of each talk, we're gonna have five, mi five minutes to ask questions. You should feel free to ask questions also during the talk, even though we are thinking that live questions should maybe um, be limited to clarification questions, given that there may be a large number of people uh, uh, coming. And you can still ask questions in the chat. And I think we, we discussed with the speakers and one idea that this, the co-authors could actually answer the questions in the chat. And for those who have, been, who have not been answered, we could uh, you know, ask them again at the, at the very end when we have uh, time for questions. Um, let me also grab this opportunity to thank the Market Design Initiative at Columbia University to the Program for Economic Research for providing very precious help in organizing this event. Um, this is about all I wanted to say, so let me introduce the first speaker with um, Alfred Galichon, and so professor at uh, New York University. So Alfred, uh, you're going to present a joint work with uh, Pauline Corbley and Jeremy Fox. So you have 55 minutes, and I'll let you know after 45 minutes um, that you'll have 10 minutes uh, remaining. So to you, Alfred, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Olivier, and, and thank you so much, Yonkou, uh, to put together this uh, uh, super nice conference and to invite me. Um, so I'm going to present you a paper which has some econometrics motivations, and I'll talk about it at the end, although I will not actually present the application, which we're uh, currently working on. So it's, it's a work in progress still. Uh, and it's a work that I'm doing with Pauline Corblet, who's a PhD student at Sciences Po on the market uh, next year, um, uh, and uh, Jeremy Fox uh, at Rice University. Uh, both of them, I think, are uh, here uh, on, the, on the chat, uh, so you can uh, communicate with them as well. It's actually super nice because, you know, I can create confusion and then they have to, they have to, 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 to catch it up and, and, and to, and to reply uh, tricky questions. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing in this work and, and let me uh, uh, first uh, position the paper in the literature. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I have posted the slides uh, on GitHub uh, just because I think it, it's nice, uh, especially for those uh, online talks. It's nice if you want to go to back to the, the previous page or something like that. It's, uh, it's much easier than having to ask, uh, to ask me. So they're on this link. Uh, actually, if you go to my webpage, uh, there are there's, there's also a link that you have here. And I also put the uh, link on the, uh, on the chat uh, so you could be able to access. Um, so this workshop is about uh, a dynamic aspect of matching models. So I should not have to convince you that dynamic aspects are important to matching. Uh, let me briefly talk about the applications that we have in mind. We are going to present a model with prices with actually trans fully transferable utility. Uh, so the types of, of applications that we have in mind are mostly the first two that are listed here. Uh, namely labor economics uh, and family economics. Uh, and, and obviously in labor economics, uh, we have in mind a, a, a human capital idea where basically employer and employees match, uh, but uh, they also accumulate human capital that is going to be dependent on who they are matching with. Uh, okay, so if, if, if I'm a worker, it's going to matter for my future productivity which firm I intern with, 
when I enter the uh, labor force. Uh, and similarly for a firm, uh, you know, maybe not, uh, uh, maybe not at, a, at, 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 at an entry level, but, but you know, some employees are going to have a determining uh, impact on uh, uh, you know, the evolution of those firms. So this is the type of ideas that we have in mind. So I'm going, when I'm going to take my matching decision, uh, I'm going to be mindful not only on my current period uh, uh, payoff, on the output that I'm producing with my match, with the firm I'm matched with, but also the effect that it's going to have on my own time. Okay, and we'll have a model uh, inspired by Rust, but Rust is a one-sided model. Here is going to be a two-sided version of Rust model, where basically I'm going to choose who I match with, uh, and, and then basically this choice is going to have uh, uh, an impact on the evolution of my own type, okay? So my type is not only static, my type is going to evolve over time, depending on my path decision in a more coherent way. We're going to see that in a minute, okay? We also have uh, family economics applications in mind. I'll take, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, at the end of another application we have in mind, where basically, we view the, 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 the marriage market as a multi-stage market. Uh, and it's you know, the nature of the marriage market uh, uh, today that you know, people, most people uh, uh, marry, you know, match several times. Uh, uh, many people marry several times. We are interested in uh, basically how the decision, the marital decision that people make, uh, choose a partner, a fertility decision, number of kids, uh, you know, this is going to have an impact on, on, on your actions and your value, so to speak, on the secondary matching market. Okay, so we are interested in, in, in questions, for example, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, is there some assortativeness on the number of existing kids, you know, when you recreate families? Uh, so, so, so this is also uh, um, a, a market where basically when you match, you might not, not only be concerned about what's going, to, what's going to happen now, but, but also potentially you might anticipate what's going to happen uh, after the, the, the divorce. You know, if you're very rational, you might, you might, you might, you might do things like that and, and, and try to anticipate, uh, you know, if you have this extra kid, uh, what it might do to your value on the secondary uh, marriage market. Okay. Other examples include uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, obviously big dynamic effect here, uh, school choice. So school choice is really not so much in the framework because again, I'm going to talk about transferable utility, uh, but there will be excellent uh, uh, presentations later uh, in this workshop about it and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have a framework in the paper that's not in the presentation, but in the paper, we have a framework for those dynamic matching problems. Uh, with and without an observed heterogeneity. In the presentation, I'm going to present the case with an observed heterogeneity. So it's going to be a model that will have the feature of show and show, uh, if, if you know this uh, uh, important empirical model of matching uh, uh, with transferable utility. Uh, but obviously we can take the limit without heterogeneity. And uh, uh, you know, I might say a word at the end of the presentation of that. Uh, the, 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 the case with that heterogeneity. Same thing, in the paper, we have the finite horizon case and the infinite horizon case. Uh, I'm going to straight uh, uh, go to the infinite horizon case and the stationary case, but I'll say a word at the end of the presentation, what happens for the finite horizon case, which, which might be interest, of interest in some context. And what we're going to do, we're going to well, basically solve the equivalent problem that we will spend most of our time on that today. Uh, but, but what we want to do eventually, and I started by saying it's, it's, it's you know, uh, our preoccupation, our econometric, econometricians' preoccupations, what we want to do is structural estimation. I will show that once we have uh, solved for the equilibrium uh, with the formalism I'm going to introduce, it is actually very easy to go to the structural estimation. Uh, once the two are set up, uh, and it's going to be a couple of extra slides, and I'm going to show you how it works. Okay. And then obviously, why do we want to do that? Well, we want to be able to do comparative statics. We want to do it. We want to be able to do welfare analysis. All you do when you do structural work. Um, so let me position uh, our contribution in the literature 
we really are going to use the tools of uh, uh, models uh, there are static models with transferable utility and random utility, uh, starting with show and show. It's really this very uh, inspirational paper of show and show 2006 uh, that uh, motivated a lot of our uh, own research. Uh, Jeremy uh, has papers uh, on the framework. Uh, I have a paper that I'm going to talk about uh, with Bernard Salamier. Uh, and with Arnaud, and another one with Arnaud Dupuis. Uh, Bernard, my co-author, has a paper with uh, Capori and Weiss, uh, and, and there are lots of other papers on the topic. The idea here is that basically show and, the show and show framework, for those who don't know show and show, uh, is a Becker model. So it's a matching model with transferable utility where you add a logic structure. So you add a random utility. I'm going to show you exactly how. Uh, and uh, then the nice uh, advantage of this is that, well, first of all, it accounts for some unobserved heterogeneity. You don't observe everything that uh, partners in the matching market. Uh, but also more practically, uh, it's going to give you some smoothness. Uh, you know that the Becker, Becker Chaplet Schubik model is a linear programming model. So it doesn't have any smoothness. Uh, it has kinks and hence you get non uniqueness, you get non differentiabilities you get features that are going to make econometrics difficult uh, because you're going to have set identification, for instance. With the show and show framework, you remove those disadvantages and that's the interest of you know, going logic, so to speak. Uh, you're going to get nice inversion formulas and, and, and very nice uh, estimation uh, procedures. I'll talk about that in a minute. But obviously we want to blend this, uh, this uh, show and show type uh, of models with a dynamic uh, um, uh, model. And here, obviously, our inspiration is Rust. Uh, Rust is a one-sided uh, uh, discrete choice model blended with uh, dynamic programming. Uh, we want to do that in the two-sided case. Okay? In Rust, you have a single uh, decision maker, uh, Harold Zerker, who's the maintenance engineer that wants to repair a fleet of buses. Buses don't have their say of what's going to happen to them. Okay, Here, we're in a context where both parts of the match uh, have a say and need to mutually agree on uh, being matched and, and also are going to be forward looking in the sense that they're going to also anticipate uh, the evolution on their types, okay, on each side of the market. So we'll see how uh, we can build a two-sided version of a uh, Rust uh, model, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, this is really our aspiration here. Let me position the paper uh, in the literature, mostly to say what we are not doing. Uh, so basically, you know, there are a bunch of uh, uh, papers on the NTU case, uh, and that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, very useful for problems that we don't cover, such as school choice, possibly, such as kidney exchanges, definitely. Um, so I list some papers here. There are many more, and I apologize for those I have not cited. Um, this uh, stream of the literature, uh, either in transferable utility or non-transferable utility, uh, that does search and matching, uh, where basically people meet randomly and decide whether they want to uh, match or not. And this is obviously uh, uh, intrinsically a dynamic matching problem, because basically when, when, when partners meet in isolation and decide whether they want to match or not, they need to compare uh, to their uh, uh, res reservation utility of, of staying unmatched and, and waiting for a better match. Um, and then um, our, our paper is closest in spirit uh, to a very nice series of paper uh, uh, with uh, many authors, including uh, Xiu, the Xiu of Xiu and Xiu and McCann uh, and co-authors uh, who have uh, basically a two, two period matching model where um, individuals in the first period uh, match with uh, universities. And then because they match with universities, their human capital is going to uh, depend on which universities they match with. Okay, so some universities are better than others at, uh, give, at, at, at evolving uh, the student's human capital. And then based on that human capital, they're going to match in a second period with firms, okay? Uh, so it's 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 basically so two you know what what we do is 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 a stationary extension of their setup essentially. 
Uh, uh, and last, uh, Eugene Cho has a, a marriage paper uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, so it's a dynamic matching problem uh, where people match according to the age of marriage uh, with uh, uh, exogenous dissolution. Uh, and I'll discuss a little bit later the uh, difference between uh, our, our setup and his. So let me uh, move to the framework. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, basically highlight uh, the essential ideas of what we're doing. Uh, and to be true, there's a lot of uh, formalism, so I'll try to make that part uh, uh, smooth. Uh, I want to uh, I want to show you that basically there's one object that uh, that is really going to be key in the analysis. And then once we uh, master what this object is, we can really basically uh, work out the stationary equations, work out the estimation equations, and so on and so forth. So let me uh, put together some notations. And again, I'm assuming that uh, uh, you can use the slides, you can download the slides and use them if you want to refer uh, to this page six, uh, where the main notations are. I'm considering a population of agents, a Z. Uh, so it's going to be a bipartite model. Uh, so Z can either be a worker or a firm. Okay. Uh, so you know, typically in some of you know in, in, in some other papers, X is going to be a, a worker and Z is going to be a firm. Uh, these are types, actually. Very importantly, these are types. These are not individuals. Uh, so X is going to be a worker's type and Y is going to be a firm's type, and there are going to be many worker of the same type. Actually, infinitely many. So so when I say number you really should uh, understand mass because the large market assumption is going to be very important twice in this paper, okay? So implicitly we will twice use a law of, of uh, large numbers. First, when we consider this free choice problem and second, when we look at the market transitions, okay? So, so think really that we're in the lar large market limit. This is very important. Um, so QZ is going to be the mass, the num you know, I, I say number because it's more intuitive, but really, again, think mass, think mass. Uh, QZ is going to be the mass of agents of type Z. And again, Z can be either a worker or a firm. Uh, we're not assuming that there's the same number of workers and firms because they might be, uh, they will be, we will leave the possibility of unassigned agents. And precisely, let's talk about matches. Huh? So a match is going to be A, and we took this notation A because it's going to be an arc. Uh, so a match can be either uh, 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 basically a match between a worker and a firm. So it, either it can be X, Y, or you can match uh, with the exterior, meaning not match, meaning re remain assigned. Uh, so you can have a, a worker that remains unassigned. In this case, A is X, uh, and A is going to be Y if it's a firm that remains unassigned. Okay, uh, so, so here we, are, we really have a two-sided model uh, where we leave the possibility for people to remain on a side. Um, so um, because we have uh, uh, pairs and on a side agents, we're going to introduce, it's going to be useful later, we're going to introduce WA. WA, so that's the weight of the match, that's the continuity of the match. Okay, so when it's a match pair, it's going to be two. And when it's a, a, an unassigned agent, it's just going to be one. Uh, and then uh, we are going to introduce, so why do people match? They, they match because they want to basically get some uh, uh, payoff out of it. And remember, this is a transferable utility model. So we're going to assume that if you have a match X, Y, uh, the model uh, specification is going to be the joint utility, the joint payoff. Uh, of X and Y, which is to be split between them. Okay, it's going to be split endogenously at equilibrium. Uh, and I'm going to call S style A, the joint transferable surplus of a match A. So remember, A is going to be X, Y if it's a match pair, but it also could be X if it's a, a non-match worker or Y if it's a non-match firm. And this is here, remember I said earlier that show and show is Becker meets uh, McFadden. Uh, so it's a TU model uh, with a logic structure embedded. And this is where uh, show and show's assumption of separable random utility comes into play. We're going to assume that S style 
I put this style because there's a random component or there's a idiosynchronic component, which is uh, going to vary within uh, uh, agent of a given uh, type. So we're going to write that uh, uh, this joint transferable surplus S style A is equal to a deterministic part S of A, which will be the focus of our, of our, of our, of our, of our work. Basically, we want to estimate the deterministic part of the uh, joint payoff of a match. Okay, this is the utility of matching. But it plus, we're going to have plus a random utility term. Okay, plus a random utility term. So plus basically, so here it's a complicated way to say that there's a worker on a firm effect. There's epsilon X plus epsilon Z, or just epsilon X if X remains on a sign, or just epsilon uh, Y if Y remains on a sign. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the separ se separable random utility assumption of show and show uh, that basically the uh, joint surplus is equal to the deterministic part that depends on X and Y, uh, that depends on A, plus a sum uh, where basically I'm summing the contribution of each idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic uh, uh, terms, uh, which are payoff shifters, if you want, uh, epsilon X plus epsilon Y. Okay. Uh, Alfred, this is Yash. Can I ask a quick clarification? Sure. So this, uh, as far as I know, in the true and shoe model, these uh, payoff shifters are for every type Z, they have a different payoff shifter for every type on the other side, right? So uh, here, is it the case that they have only one payoff shifter no matter who they match with, or does it also, can it, is it different for different uh, types on the other side? Thanks a lot. So it's a great question. There's an A missing here. It's epsilon A Z. Oh, sorry, it's epsilon Z A. So, so oh. you're absolutely right. It's it's uh, it's match specific shifter. Sorry, oh. there's a typo. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. So um, just following up on that to make sure I understand. Yeah. So basically, I should think of this as idios for even an individual agent, the epsilons are idiosyncratic across type partners that I might have, as well as across my outside option of going unmatched. Exactly. Uh, so basically, the epsilon, they're going to vary. So if, you, if I take a worker x, two workers x might draw different epsilons. But, uh, but, but, but each worker, each individual worker, cannot distinguish between uh, two firms that have the same observable type, two firms that have the same one. Right, so I am indifferent, or at least I can't observe the difference between two different y's. That's right, that's right, that's absolutely Great. right. Thank you. Yeah. So now let's see what, uh, uh, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for essentially two equilibrium quantities. The first is going to be PZ, so that's the payoff of Z. So again, we saw that uh, there's some idiosyncratic variation within Z. Uh, but here, what we're really interested in, and the relevant quantity is going to be the average of a Z of the payoff of Z, okay? So remember, it's a transferable utility model. We're going to split this uh, surplus here. We're going to split this utility here. Uh, and then, you know, some of this part is going to be to come from the, the splitting of S, S, A, and it's going to be deterministic. Some is going to come from the random part. Uh, but we, so basically this is going to uh, depend on which idiosyncratic uh, uh, shock I have. But when we're going to take the average across individuals of the same type Z, uh, we're going to get PZ. So PZ is the ex ante uh, expected payoff of uh, an individual of type Z. Okay, so that's the first important quantity. And the second important quantity is going to be mu A. Uh, that's going to be the mass of a match A. Uh, so it's the number of matches of type XY or, or, or of type X or of type Y at equilibrium. And here, um, the very important result is due to show and show and says that uh, basically we can relate those two, those two quantities at equilibrium by what uh, show and show called a matching function. Um, so, and it's actually uh, uh, an exercise we call at the end of the slide in the appendix. I'm not going to do it here today, but it's an exercise in the logit framework. Uh, you can show that actually by using the conditional choice probabilities, you can show that mu a, the number of, of, of matches a, uh, is equal to exponential of, well, let's leave the uh, wait for a minute, the systematic part of the surplus plus the sum over well, across x and y 
of the log of the number of agents of that type minus uh, uh, the payoff of, uh, of those types. Okay. Uh, and then this is weighted, this is divided by two if uh, we're talking about uh, uh, a pair. And this is not divided by two. It's it's the the factor the fact the weight factor is one if it's a non-match age. Okay, so this is a fundamental result, uh, and it simplifies a lot the analysis because it means that looking for mu is actually looking for p. Uh, p is an equilibrium quantity. How do you solve for p? Well, you have to express the fact that the quantities of agents of each type q z is known and is fixed. Okay. Here, we're still in the static case. So, so, so this is a fixed quantity. Later on, it's going to evolve. And that's going to be part of the point. But for now, QZ is fixed. And basically, P is kind of the price of, uh, of Z. Uh, you're going to have uh, uh, you know, really an equilibrium equation. Uh, it's really a, more, uh, a supply and demand equation that, uh, that, that, that is going to tell you that basically the equilibrium payoffs PZ that are going to clear the market solve for this equation. Okay. So this is uh, the work of Cho and Cho, uh, uh, which which you can recognize under this uh, on the, under this form uh, that basically uh, the vector of P Z solves for this uh, 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 this system of equations. Okay. So uh, we built on Cho and Cho analysis with Bernard Salanier by showing that actually there was a very nice way and very tractable way to solve this problem. Uh, which, which is to interpret this problem as an optimization problem. And uh, uh, actually what we did with Bernard Salanier is that we showed that, uh, well, basically because uh, at equilibrium, um, uh, uh, we, sorry, we showed that basically at equilibrium, solving this system of equations, so solving for P was equivalent to solving an optimization problem. So let me give some intuition about this uh, optimization problem. The first idea is to say, well, I have two ways to count the total number of individuals in this market. Okay, the first way is trivial. It's just summing QZ across Z. Okay, if I sum QZ across Z, I get the total number of individuals, workers plus firms in this economy. The second way is to count the number of matches. Okay. If it's uh, a pair, I'm going to uh, put uh, a factor two. And if it's a single uh, individual, I'm going to put a factor one. So the sum over A of W A mu A is another way to count the total number of individuals in this economy. And then I know that mu A, according to Shou and Tio, should depend on P. So I'm going to replace mu A by, by this expression. Uh, this exponential of essentially the surplus minus P with the log Q inside. Uh, and it's going to uh, uh, define a very important function, which I'm going to call the zero function. Uh, so the zero function is a function and it's going to be really the main building block of our analysis. Okay, so it's a function that depends on Q, on P, and on S, the vector of surplus, uh, where here uh, P is the unknown. So it's this function that is basically equal to zero at equilibrium because it's basically the first, the first part of the expression counts the number of pairs uh, breaking down by pair, breaking down by matches. So it's the sum of A of WA times the candidate expression uh, for a mu A minus the sum at the individual level, sum of a, of a Z to Z, okay? And what do we see? We see that miraculously, when you take the derivative of z of this uh, function z with respect to pz, uh, you see that basically here uh, pz pz is going to arise only at the pairs that contain z. Uh, so you get that you're going to get the sum of the matches that contain a, okay, of mu a, okay, which is exactly the quantity which at equilibrium is equal to qz. So when you derive z with respect to the price of z, you're going to get the, uh, the, the, the number, you, you're going to get the candidate number of individual of type z, okay? So what does it mean? It means that with a minus sign, sorry, which is missing, with a minus sign, which is missing. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that basically, if I uh, add to my function z 
the sum of z of qz pz. I'm going to get that the first order condition associated with this optimization problem, this, this optimization problem is going to actually be a very nice optimization problem because the objective function here is convex. So I'm minimizing here a convex objective function, uh, which has very nice implication for uniqueness and for the set of, you know, uh, for comparative statics and, and, and the likes. Uh, I know that basically the price P that minimizes this expression is going to be such that QZ will be equal to minus the derivative of Z with respect to P, which again is going to be uh, the sum of the matches that contain A. So basically at equilibrium, I'm gonna get equilibrium if and only if I uh, am a minimizer of this function, okay? If uh, you know uh, matching theory well, uh, in the TU case, you can recognize uh, a disguised version of shape, shape place to Schubert, which is the dual of the opt optimal assignment problem. Okay, and here typically, this is the sum over X of the number of X times the utility of X plus the sum of a Y of number of Y times the utility of Y. And here, this function Z, you know that in Chaplin and Schubert, you are minimizing this, this first term subject to the uh, constraint that express the absence of a blocking pair, so the stability constraints. Uh, the stability constraints in Chaplin should be would be that Px would be greater or equal than Sx, and Py would be greater or equal than S Sy. And for a pair x and y, you would get that Px plus Py would be greater or equal than S Xy. This would be the absence of blocking pairs. This is exactly what this function z implements uh, in a soft way. Okay, because because of the Essentially, because of the random utility, we don't have hard constraints, but we have soft constraints, meaning that basically the more you violate the, the constraint, the uh, higher will be the value of Z. Okay, and, and, and uh, so, so, you know, we, we're going to try to avoid those blocking pairs without completely banning them. As a matter of fact, if we were to put a constant in front of uh, the random utility terms here, sigma, basically, we could let sigma tends to zero to converge to the model without random utility. And we would see that the soft penalization here that is induced by Z would become a hard penalization, meaning we would get plus infinity if the constraints, the stability constraints are not met and zero otherwise, okay? And, but here we're working with random utility. So we're content with this. So let's keep in mind that the essential function for all of the analysis is this zero function here. Uh, and the zero function, conceptually, it's super simple. It's basically uh, the num total number of individuals accounted for at the match level minus the total number of individuals accounted for at the individual level, where obviously you replace mu a by its candidate expression as a function. Okay, let's see uh, what we can do. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if I can jump in, uh, Ithias, again. Uh, so, sure. so you, you, uh, I'm sure you're aware of Pesky's work where he's showing that in a certain matching uh, context, the equilibrium uh, minimizes some, maximizes some utility plus entropy type of function. So I was wondering if there is some spiritual similarity between this optimization problem. Is it also got some, has it, does it have like a utility plus entropy type of interpretation or? Yeah, I mean, you know, the initial paper that 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 had the uh, you know maximization of surplus plus entropy was our paper with Bernard Savanier back in 2011. Uh, so yeah, obviously this is this is this is very very much there. Uh, um, uh, now, if I recall well, uh, Pesky's paper has uh, uh, basically a, um, a search component, uh, so it's not exactly the same uh, uh, the same type of analysis. Okay. But uh, but this is underlying in all of those papers, and and, and same thing in, in Conrad Mansell and and Dax Fick, uh, uh, work. There's also you know in all those papers there's this trade-off between a systematic part and a, and a, and an entropy part because basically the logic structure gives you the entropy. That's that's the essential message. I see. I see. Perfect. Thank you. Just one quick, I guess this is still a cl clarifying question. So the uh, point about soft penalization is a bit confusing to me. Are you allowing uh, stability to be violated uh, for some realizations? So, so stability I will, yeah, that's a great question. Stability at the individual level will never be violated. Uh, but at the individual level, uh, we, have the, we have to take into account the excellence. 
right? Right. So at the aggregate level, you know, it appears as stability is violated, but uh, but if you go back to the individual level, it's never violated. Right. Right. I guess when you let, yeah. you know, if you have a scaling factor in front of the random utility, and if you let it tend to zero, both coincide because there's no more heterogeneity. Right. So the solution okay. from that, uh, your problem, that the way you set it up uh, will, will coincide with the standard, you know, sharply Shubik. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. At the individual level, yes, yes. But, but my level of description is at the aggregate level. So I'm aggregating people by observable types. But for instance, in my paper with Bernard Salanier, we have a section where we look at the problem at the individual level. Uh, and at the individual level, we need to worry about those epsilons. And, and at the individual level, it's, it's, it's completely, I mean, from the book, basically, the notion of stability from shape like should be. But aggregating this is going to give you this nonlinear feature here. Thank you. Okay, so now, uh, and I'm sorry if those uh, remainders were a little bit long, but we, we needed that uh, to go forward. Um, so now we can uh, build up the dynamic version of the model. Uh, and the idea is really going to be a Rust type of model uh, in the sense that it's going to become precise in a minute. So the idea is what? The idea is that basically, if you have uh, a match A, uh, it's going to create at the future, sorry, sorry. If you, are, if you have a match A at a given period, it's going to create transitions towards individual type at the future period, okay? So let me define what's important here. What's important here is this RZA. This is the transition matrix. So RZA is defined, I read, as the mass of individual Z induced forward at the next period by one unit of a match A, okay? So let me take an example in, 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 in order to clarify that. If you think of this worker firm example, where matching with a given firm is going to let my human capital evolve, okay? It means that basically, if I'm a worker of type X, in an XY match, uh, basically matching at this period with a firm of type Y is going to induce a transition uh, possibly random transition. I mean, not at the aggregate level, but it's you know possible multiple transitions. It's going to introduce transitions from my type X to other types X prime. Okay, and more more specifically, uh, the uh, the worker of type workers of type X will transition to types X prime with probability p X prime given X y. And similarly, on the other side of the market, right, a firm of type Y, which is matched with a worker X, is going to have uh, uh, transitions to types Y prime with probability Q of Y prime given X, Y. So in that case, what does it mean? In that case, it means that basically R of Z, A, while Z uh, can be either a worker or, or a firm, if uh, Z is a worker, R is simply P, and if uh, 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 Y is a firm, R is simply Q, the transition matrix on the side of the curve. Okay, yeah, you see? So what does it mean? It means that basically we really are in a Rust model in the sense that basically we have Markovian transition. First of all, I'm going to choose my match. Okay, so X is going to choose A based on the vector of random utility drawn based on, on basically uh, 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 their type. Okay. Uh, and that's going to introduce, that's going to in induce a conditional choice probability mu of A, mu of XY divided by QY. This is the mass of matches of type XY divided by the number of individual X, okay? So that's going to be done in the first part. That's the choice problem. And then uh, in the second part, we're going to have the transition uh, to the next period where basically uh, the, the, uh, the worker, the worker of type X is going to transition to another type X prime with the probability R of X prime given X Y. Okay. And just as in Rust, uh, this is a Markov chain, meaning that basically the transition of X towards X prime only depends on the choice made expressed by uh, the individual. They might depend on epsilon two periods ago, but they don't. We assume that they don't. Okay? They might in theory depend, but we assume the assumption that we impose, it's, it's a Rust type Markov assumption, is that this is not the case here, okay? 
So if you want to compute, for instance, the conditional transition probability uh, of going from X to X prime, okay, of going from human capital X to human capital X prime, this is equal to the sum across the possible matches of mu X, Y divided by two X, your probability of choosing Y conditional matching times your probability of transitioning to X prime condition or having match with Y, okay? So this is going to be very important for the way we set up the matching problem, because now, you know, if we're not myopic and we're going to assume that we are not myopic, we're going to assume that everybody discounts the future with a discounting rate beta. If we're not myopic, then basically the joint surplus that uh, we need to consider is not only going to be the, uh, uh, the one period surplus phi A, but it's also going to uh, have to have to incorporate an accrual term, which comes from the fact that we're going to anticipate our, the future value uh, on each side of the match, okay? So in the form of the worker firm example, uh, both the worker and the firm, they need to uh, look at the, the probability of transitions. If they choose a certain match, they need to look at the, the probability of transitions that these choices will induce, and they need to compute the expected uh, future payoff that is going to be induced by the transition, okay? So what is this? Basically, S of A is going to be phi of A. So phi of A is the short-term payoff. This is now the focus of our analysis because we're going to distinguish it from S. Uh, phi of A is the short-term payoff, uh, but we're gonna have plus beta times the expected utility on the worker side and on the firm side, which all together is subsumed, subsumed with this uh, uh, R terminology. And this is going to be the expected payoff of the worker plus the expected payoff of the firm, taken uh, those transitions in consideration, okay? So now what are we going to do? We're going to take the same function as before, the function Z, uh, but we are going to simply, remember the function Z that was here, we're going to simply insert uh, uh, the expression of S that takes into account those are cool. Okay, so we're going to replace S by phi plus the expected discounted utility of the worker and the firm. Okay, or just of the worker if it's, if it's a single match. Okay. Could I ask huh? one clarifying question? Yes, sure. So are there still these epsilon um, distributed or gamble distributed preference shocks in the model? And at which point are they drawn? Yeah, so they are here, but we've integrated all of them. So, so again, we're in a large population limit. Uh, so the only thing that is going to matter for us will be the transition probability. But you see that, for instance, you know, uh, where we see them is here when I wrote, when I, when I, when I say that there's going to be a probability of choosing a match A, which is X, Y, given X, it means that basically th these are, this, is a, this is the outcome of a random choice problem. So, so, so it's, it's not going to be basically every, every X are going to have the same optimal Y. Because of the logic feature, we're going to have basically non-zero uh, uh, choice probabilities for, for every possible match. In, in terms of timing, so uh, I'm born and then as an individual, all the epsilons realize for me or do they realize over time? I'm, I'm just asking. It's uh, basically, it's because of the Markov assumption it's not gonna make no difference, but uh, the preferred interpretation will be that at each period I'm drawing my epsilon. But I don't understand the second part because if they are drawn later, then I have an option value of learning, which potentially uh, will influence my decision given these transitions. Uh, I don't think so because, because uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's, it, this is more than a clarifying question, I should say, but it's an interesting one. Uh, but I don't think so because essentially, because essentially of this large market assumption. But okay. uh, thank you. Um, but this is a very good question, uh, um, and 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 you know it it it, uh, it, it deserves a, a, a it, it deserves a little bit more. So so let uh, let me think about it. Um, okay, so we're taking this function z and we're plugging in uh, the 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 surplus where the surplus is going to have this uh, you know, discounted utility feature. And then we're gonna see what happens uh, just with Z, okay? And, and again, the idea is that basically uh, based on, uh, you know, we can use this potential Z uh, and take the derivatives with respect to uh, all the parameters. So here the parameters are what? 
The parameters are Q. Remember, Q is the number of agents of each type. Uh, P, which is basically the payoffs at the current period of everybody. And P prime, which is the, the payoffs of people at the next period uh, and uh, uh, at, the, at the next period. Obviously, we're going to look at the stationary equilibrium in a minute where P will be equal to P prime. Okay, but for now, it's important and interesting to distinguish them. So let's see what we have. We have the uh, derivative of Z with respect to two. So the derivative of Z with respect to two, uh, if you do the calculation, you're gonna find that it's actually uh, the uh, sum over the matches uh, in which Z is involved of mu A divided by two Z minus one. Okay, minus one because the minus one term comes from the, derivative, the, the derivation of the, second, of the second term. So what is this? This is uh, the excess demand for type Z, right? Because basically mu A of divided by QZ is going to be the conditional uh, uh, choice probability of a, a potential partner Y. If I sum this over Y, I have something that in theory at equilibrium should be equal to one huh? because uh, at equilibrium, the sum of the market share should be one, okay? So the first condition, the condition on, 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 on equilibrium will be that excess, that, that sorry, the, the excess demand for each of the types should be zero. So that's gonna give, give us one of the equations of the model. Uh, let's now take a look at the derivative of Z with respect to P Z, P little Z. Huh? And we see very, actually very easily, uh, this, is the, this is what I said already before when I talked about the static case, that the derivative of, of the zero function with respect to PZ is equal to uh, the sum of the number of matches in which Z is involved, okay, which is a uh, candidate for being the number of individuals of type Z at the current period. Okay, and now let's look at the derivative of uh, the zero function with respect to P prime Z. Uh, and we see, so when we are with respect to P prime Z, we see that this Markov is this Markov operator in front of it. Okay, so we see that this is actually basically the mass of individual, if we look at the expression, we see that this is the mass of individual of type Z that is induced by the forward transition at the next period, okay? So all those building blocks together, and you see because you know, we know that one unit of match A is going to yield a number R Z A of individuals at the next period. Uh, so when we basically take into account the fact that there are mu A uh, match of type A at the given period, this is what we're gonna have, okay? So basically we see that we are going to be able just with Z, just with the uh, derivatives, just with the derivatives of Z, we are going to be able to formulate a rational expectation uh, a stationary equilibrium in the sense that well, basically we should get that P equals P prime. This is rational expectation, basically. Uh, in the stationary model, uh, uh, P should not depend on T. Okay, second thing, we should get market clearing for each type. So that's the derivative of Z with respect to QZ equals zero. Okay, and the last one is a stationarity. So the number of type Z that I have today should be equal to the number of type Z that are induced at the next period by my Markov transition. And I can sum this up, summarize this as beta times the derivative of Z with respect to PZ, plus the derivative of Z with respect to PZ prime, P prime Z, sorry, should be equal to zero for each Z, okay? Alfred, so this to, is the set of just, equilibrium equation that we Alfred, have. Alfred, just to let you know, you have a little bit less than, than 10 minutes now. A little less than 10 minutes, okay, so, that sounds good, thanks a lot. Uh, just to remark on the function Z, Z is a function which is concave in Q and jointly con con convex in P and P prime, okay? So we are going to look at a case, which is a very specific case uh, where beta equals one. So beta equals one, B beta remember is the discounting factor. Beta equals one uh, is the case where we don't discount anything, uh, uh, where basically we're infinitely patient. Uh, and, uh, uh, Maybe you know from uh, uh, you know linear programming and and, uh, and actually this is very specific intersection of linear programming and dynamic programming that uh, dynamic programming uh, when the discounting rate uh, uh, tends to one is equal to one 
has a linear programming formulation. So we should not be surprised uh, to see interesting things happening when beta tends to one. So let's start with this. Let's start with beta equals one, and then we'll go back to the general case. So when beta equals one, you see, we have this function Z, it's, con it's concave in two and convex in two two prime. Well, you see here, this really looks like first order condition, okay? Uh, and Z is convex concave, so it cannot be optimality condition, but it can be saddle point conditions, okay? So basically when beta equals one, we can set, uh, because we are setting p equals to p prime, we can, we can redefine a function f, which is going to be f of qp will be z of p of qpp, where we set p prime equals to p. And we see that the uh, uh, stationarity equation of the model are given by the derivative of f with respect to q equals zero, and the derivative of f with respect to p is equal to zero, okay? So what does it mean? It means that basically the uh, stationarity uh, equation uh, are simply the saddle point condition for a min-max problem. Okay, here we have a, a function, a legitimate function, which is concave in Q and convex in P. And we're saying that basically the quantities that we're looking for, uh, they should minimize with respect to P, the maximum with respect to Q of F of, Q, of, of QP, okay? So this is not only a well-posed problem, but uh, it's also a problem that it can be computed very efficiently. Uh, so there are first order schemes that look like gradient descent, but that are not exactly gradient descent. Uh, and uh, the most famous one uh, nowadays is Chambolpoc. Chambolpoc is actually very nice because it's going to work with uh, uh, non-smooth regularization, uh, which we will need when we, uh, when we do the open metrics. Uh, so chambol poc is a variant of gradient descent. I don't have time to enter into this, but this actually converges very, very nicely. Uh, chambol pocs first order scheme uh, is an algorithm that computes, that computes saddle points uh, uh, in, this, in this fashion. The very surprising thing uh, is that, so this is for the min-max problem, but again, you know, we don't want to only solve uh, uh, the case beta equals one. Actually, we're, we're, we're more interested in beta less than one in general. But the very surprising fact is that Chambolpox algorithm also works when the tie is with one. I don't know why this is. I don't know why this is. We observed it. It's working very well on simulations. I don't have a theory for beta less than one. This is no longer a min-max problem. These are no longer, this is no longer a variational problem. Uh, it still works very well. There's probably a theory to be developed, uh, uh, but, uh, but I leave this uh, as a puzzle for this talk. Just because I have, I have what, five more minutes? Is that it, Olivier, or? or yeah. Four yeah. More? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I said that I would talk about some econometrics. Uh, and, and, you know, luckily, the tools we develop can be adapted very nicely to do some econometrics. So when I say doing econometrics, I mean the problem of estimating phi. Phi, again, is the myopic surplus, the myopic joint surplus of a match. And we might, uh, basically take basis function by AK uh, and expand phi on that basis of functions, of, of, uh, of functions and look for the parameter. So we're going to write that phi A is the sum of a K of phi AK times lambda K. And we are looking for lambda. Uh, and we're going to look for lambda such that the uh, observed moments uh, are going to match uh, the observed kth moment of this function k, of those basis function k, uh, phi, are going to match with uh, the predicted moment. So how is this done? Well, still by taking the zero function and still by taking partial derivatives. Why? Because now let's plug in the expression, the parametric expression for phi in the expression of z. So now we have something which is parameterized by q the vector of quantities p, the vector of current period payoffs, p prime, the, the vector of next period uh, payoffs, and lambda, the parameter vector. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we note that, well, you know, I talked about the partial derivative of z with respect to q, p, and p prime, and we gave an interpretation for them in terms of supply and demand and forward induction. Uh, but the last thing that we have is now when we derive z with respect to lambda k, with respect to lambda k, you see what's going to happen. Well, basically, we're going to have here in the exponential this phi a k term that is going to come out, 
uh, the weights are going to cancel out. Sorry, I'm not going to do fully the math, but trust me on that. What we're going to get is that when we uh, take the derivative of z with respect to lambda k, we're going to get the predicted kth moment of phi. Okay. So this is something very nice because we can match, we can now look for lambda that is going to match the predicted moment with the observed moment. Okay, assuming we 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 observe mu hat, which is the stationary distribution of the matrix. Okay, so we're going to define a slightly modifi modified function uh, of z. So that's going to be z minus the sum over a of mu hat a times uh, phi uh, a k expanded of the basis. There's a sum over k missing here, and then basically the identifying equations, the estimation equations, are simply the previous equation that express that we are at equilibrium plus a supplementary equation, uh, which is that the derivative of h with respect to lambda k equals zero. This just means that the predicted moments are going to match with the observed moment. Okay. Very nicely, and I'm going to end my talk here. In the case beta equals one, this is still a saddle point problem, where now we minimize with respect to p and lambda. The function is concave, sorry, it's convex in, in p and lambda. We now maximize with respect to two. We still can apply chambolle pox first order algorithm. And the same mystery, uh, meaning that you know, when beta is strictly less than one, we still you know, empirically converge very nicely to uh, a, a solution. So now it's a solution of the estimation problem that's going to return lambda k, the parameter vector of the surplus, but also the equivalent payoffs and uh, the equivalent quantities uh, two that, uh, that we are predicting and that uh, are going to match with the absurd ones. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm done, hopefully on time. Uh, uh, you know, and, and using this tool, this, this, uh, this, this mathematical device, this function Z, uh, uh, we can do lots of other things. We can uh, look at identification issues, uh, you know, following what people do in the, uh, um, in the uh, one-sided case. Uh, we can extend uh, uh, that analysis very nicely. Uh, obviously, one of the very nice things that we would like to do is to have a theoretical understanding on why we converge outside of beta equals one. Um, and then we have uh, uh, nice empirical applications, one on the labor market, uh, uh, which, you know, again, I didn't talk today, but, uh, uh, but we, we intend uh, to do in this paper. And in another project, uh, we uh, intend to do an application to family economics, uh, uh, as I described. As I described, we want to know how marital choices that people make are going to impact their value on the remarriage uh, market. Okay, later on, and only later on, because it seems to be, you know, all this paper is about using optimization tools. Later on, we want to uh, extend this to imperfectly transferable utility. But again, you know, a transferable utility gives you all the nice tools of convex analysis. Uh, so, you know, it seems likely that it's going to be much more difficult to do imperfectly transferable utility uh, uh, using this approach. Anyway. So I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alfred. Um, for the talk, though, we do have a little bit of time for questions. We started late, so, um, so please. Uh, Feel free to ask questions at this stage. So there were lots of questions in the in the chat, but uh, uh, we're answered by thanks a lot to there. my co-authors who have taken them. So I, I can see uh, that you know um, I guess this is also the answer from Jeremy, but the there is no sort of a state in some sense so that there's you know this option value issue doesn't arise because of the iid over time structure but this is not just an interpretation right you know it doesn't it doesn't matter whether you know the realization of your uh, epsilons only for now or you know even for the future because the amount of a surplus that will be realized will be different so it's not just an interpretation you do need to uh, actually assume that you only know the current period epsilons, but not not the ones for the future, right? No, I think not. I think not, because if, even if you were uh, knowing them in advance, 
you would not be able to exploit them because it's a, it's a feature of these models with a separable uh, random utility, a la show and show, that uh, uh, you, know, you never trade your idiosyncratic part. You always keep it. Uh, you know, uh, so, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's what well, actually it's, it's the starting point of my paper with Bernard Salamier, for instance, it's a, it's a little proposition uh, that says that, you know, no matter what your epsilon is, you always keep your epsilon. Um, I see. So the knowledge about feature of epsilon doesn't affect um, which, doesn't affect the exact realized table matching. Is that what you're saying? That's right, because you you know because of this large market assumption, you compete with people that that look exactly the same as you, uh, viewed from the other 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 part of the market. Uh, so if you're trying to exploit uh, your epsilon, you're going to be beaten by competition because you know uh, viewed from uh, any firm, uh, two X's look exactly the same. So, so they're not, you know, they, they can't try to, 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 to use uh, the, the epsilon that they have. I see. So separability is really very important for this. Separability is the key. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Any further question? Otherwise, let's let's move to the second talk. Then, thank you, Alfred, a lot for for the talk. Thanks, Gil. And so, uh, yeah, Jean Coup, maybe you can share your slides. All right, can you guys see the slides? Yeah, so thanks a lot. Awesome. We are very happy to have you here. So you have 55 minutes again, and I'll let you know when uh, after 45 minutes. Excuse All right, me. thanks so much uh, for having our paper on the program. Um, so this is a paper um, about value of time, which is part of a bigger project. I'll tell you a little bit more about sort of the goals of it as we go uh, along. And I should start with, you know, this is a joint work with a bunch of people. Um, Laura from Columbia, who will be answering in the chat, um, and then um, Nick Buchholz from Princeton, uh, Tobias Alts at MIT, and Philip Mateka at, at CERGI. All right, so let's jump in. So you might have noticed recently there was a lot of discussion about Uber's operational uh, sort of a model, uh, and in particular drivers complaining about not having, or maybe not just drivers, but, but journalists as well, complaining about drivers not having the employee status, and uh, hence, California passed a bunch of laws that tries to force Lyft and Uber to actually change their employment decisions. Um, and of course, these companies are fighting this uh, to, to now because basically they're worried that their costs would go up substantially. So the goal of our project, one of the main goals of our project is actually to think about this market design question. So suppose these uh, platforms actually thought about how to sidestep this sort of regulation. So one way to do that would be to decentralize and basically just let drivers compete over passengers and then passengers choose between drivers and just to be, be a matchmaker in the middle. So you could think about the, the problem of sort of decoupling prices on both sides. So Uber might be paying something to procure drivers and might be charging something to passengers. Um, and there might be sort of competition, competition on both sides. So we might be thinking about um, what would be the benefit of the platform then? Well, one of those, uh, one of the things that come to mind is obviously, you know, you might uh, be able to um, engage in various optimization structures related to price discrimination, destination-based pricing, and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's sort of the market design side of this project. Today, we're going to start with sort of a big first ingredient into this. Uh, part which is going to be on the demand side, even though um, there's going to be a good chunk of the talk at, towards the end where I talk about the supply side, i.e. The, the drivers. Um, but uh, again, the focus of the first maybe 30 minutes or so, maybe slightly more than that, is going to be the demand side. And so we're going to be thinking about how to, how to think about value of time. This is sort of something that came to us once we started working, to, uh, working with this data set. This, 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 these data sets from these platforms are really quite... Um, unique uh, in terms of allowing uh, researchers to actually recover how people value 
value their time. And you will see on pretty much next slide um, why that's the case. Um, okay, so we're gonna be interested in, suppose we are gonna be able to recover the value of time. We're gonna be trying to think about how does that uh, relate to you know the, the recent spatial economics uh, literature? How does it relate to the geography of a city? Um, um, how the choices can actually be informative about you know the opportunity cost of time in different places, um, and then knowing the the, the heterogeneity in uh, the time value, you know how the platform can leverage how how can the platform leverage that um, in order to engage in some price discrimination. So all of this, as you will see, is going to be done using auction data. That's why I'm so excited. Um, and you know auctions are great, uh, so I don't need to convince this crowd of. All right, so here's the setting that we're gonna be looking at. It's gonna be slightly different than Uber. Uh, um, okay, so before I actually introduce the setting, I just wanna set it up with one more slide actually now. I look at this one. So if you think about taxis, um, you know, you all New Yorkers are very well familiar with those. They have a fixed price schedule, right? And all the rationing, all the, all the sort of equating of or equilibrating of supply and demand is basically done on the basis of waiting. If there's a lot of demand in front of Madison Square Garden, you just have to wait. That's it. You don't, you don't have an option to pay more uh, to get sort of a cab faster, okay? Uber and Lyft, they sort of take the other extreme, right? What they try to do is if there is an imbalance in supply and demand, well, they try to raise prices. So if you are in, st in front of Madison Square Garden at 1 a.m. and there is, you know, thousands of people um, going uh, uh, from a concert, well, then you can bet that the prices for an Uber are going to be exorbitant. There's going to be search and, you know, you will have to pay a lot. At the same time, the optimization algorithm of Uber is trying pretty much to hold waiting time stable. So that's the other extreme. What we're going to be focusing on today is a as sort of a hybrid between these two things. And so what's gonna happen is that it's gonna be um, an app-based hailing platform, um, but the rides are gonna be auctioned off, okay? So if a passenger requests a ride, drivers um, that get pinked, the platform sends sort of, um, that uh, sends a request for a bit, if you want, okay? For a particular passenger, and drivers are then free to submit a bit. Okay. So once these drivers submit a bit, this creates a choice set for a consumer, which is going to basically consist of multiple dimensions, all kinds of observables about drivers and cars, waiting times, and prices. And this choice set, this variation in the choice sets is going to be the key that is going to allow us uh, to identify a lot of the preferences on the passenger side. So this is how the this is how the uh, this is how the app actually looks. Okay, so this is me actually landing in back at the airport and requesting a ride from this platform. Okay, so I put in you know well location gets put in um, automatically. I put in a destination. I didn't want to show you where I live, so I actually deleted it. But sort of you know I requested a ride, and then these bits were pouring in. You can see that sort of the 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 screen of the phone uh, fits about four, okay? So it turns out the platform has an algorithm through which they pink the drivers. But I think to the first order approximation, you can think about them uh, pinging always four guys and you receiving four bits, okay? Sometimes in some sort of, you know, area, sometimes in, in slow times and far areas, you might not populate this whole screen, but roughly speaking, this is what we should think about. All right, so when you are thinking about the choice, um, there is a couple of things I should point out uh, right away. So there's going to be quite a salient waiting time uh, measure, which is coming pretty much from um, Google's API, like Waze. So it's pretty accurate. And um, an estimate of price, okay? So how much it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost um, for you to complete the ride. And then everything there is to know about the driver. So, you know, some rating, what type of car they drive, whether it's a premium car. And the only epsilon when you're sort of thinking about the choice from the passenger's perspective really is, so i.e. what's observable to the, to the passengers and not to us, might be how they sort of interpret the picture or how they interpret the name, okay? That's, that's pretty much the only epsilon that we make. Um, okay, so that's the setup. So we will see a universe of trips uh from a bunch from a couple of years okay 
So it turns out that's about 1 million requests. Oh, I should have said one other, I should have said one more thing. Sorry about that. So um, it turns out that these, um, the participants in this market have to be licensed caps. Okay, so it's not like your uh, Uber where anybody can sort of sign up and participate. These have to be licensed caps. And so these licensed caps have kind of an option to work with this platform, multi-home, work with this platform and sort of exclusively, um, you know, or just sort of engage mostly in street hail and just from time to time use this, you know, use this platform to find a match. So you should think about these guys as being sort of professional uh, professional uh, drivers who actually make their living uh, from riding passenger, from driving passengers. Okay, so again, we have about 1 million requests um, with about 5.6 million bits. So on average, there's slightly more than five bits uh, per request um, and about 70% of those result in rides, okay? So we will see all these observables that I have pointed out on that previous slide. Uh, and in particular, we will see all the covariates about the trips um, requested, place of origin, place of destination, whether or not the choice has been taken. We actually can construct panel, which is gonna be very important. So we will sort of see and identify for passengers. We can track passengers over time. We can track drivers over time, okay? On top of that, we actually, um, you know, augmented this data with some auxiliary sources. So in particular, you might imagine that, you know, an outside option, uh, especially in a city like Prague, um, is going to be quite important um, because, you know, public transit works pretty well as, as in most of Europe. So, you know, we have actually pretty detailed data on availability of public transit at a time of day at a place where the right is requested. So we can sort of put all of that in into our characteristics of the outside option. So that's one thing to uh, keep um, to keep in mind. We also add in weather because, as you might imagine, weather is an important shifter in, say, how you trade off time versus price. Um, we actually also include um, real estate prices and land use. All of that is basically with the intent to try to, at some at some point, um, as I'll show you, correlate sort of the estimates of the value of time with some uh, with some um, other measures. Uh, that have been used mostly in trade literature. The, um, finally, what we have done is we have actually distributed a survey um, to passengers just to figure out something about their demographics and transport usage patterns. You know, this was, I have to admit, a disappointment for me. I have never done these sort of surveys before, but the, the response rates are so low in these sort of field surveys that it, it seems like it's a total waste of time. But anyway, there is some information, you know, it's better than nothing, but it's definitely much less than I would have hoped for. Okay, in terms of the positioning this in the literature, um, I'm in the interest of time, I'm just not going to go into all these uh, papers. I'm, I think most of the uh, audience uh, is familiar with those. I just, and, and, uh, and also I want to make sure that I don't offend somebody whose paper is not on there. So I should have probably just flashed this slide and, and not really let you stare at it for too long. Uh, so let me skip that. But we're going to be sort of talking about all this, or we are contributing to that literature in the spatial, you know, equilibria um, that um, has been recently sort of uh, quite, um, quite active. Now, to motivate, again, the, um, the empirical framework, um, this, is, this graph summarizes sort of the trade-off uh, between waiting time and price, uh, as we see in the data. Okay? So you might imagine, as I've said, when the passengers request a ride and drivers submit bids, um, the drivers are more or less uh, uniformly or somehow randomly distributed, not, I shouldn't have said uniformly, but sort of randomly distributed around the passenger. The screenshot I showed you was at the airport where everybody was very close. So the waiting times were ranging between, you know, three minutes and five minutes or something like that. If you were somewhere else in the city, these waiting times might be much more dispersed. You might be facing a choice between, okay, maybe I have to pay a lot of money, but there is a cap one minute away or I pay a little bit, I pay much less and the cap is, you know, 10 minutes away. And so that's the sort of choices we're gonna be leveraging. This graph shows you that these choices actually do matter. So the top, um, I don't know what, these sort of grayish circles, um, they correspond to the probability that the minimum price is chosen 
okay, if they're conditional on there being trade-off. The bottom, I guess, what is it, stars or something like that, uh, you know, they correspond to the probability that the minimum waiting time is chosen, okay, conditional on there being a trade-off. So you see both of these are bounded away from one, so choice is really valued. So people make a choice, um, and they sort of really, there, there is scope for trying to understand what drives these, what's, what drives their choices. Um, okay, the same can be said actually over space. So, you know, this is going to be a big city. I'll show you a map at some point uh, in the talk, uh, which we partition into something like 30 areas. Um, and so now what we have done in this graph is, back, is actually sort by pickup locations based on the probability the minimum price is chosen, okay? So these, you can think about these locations as being anonymous, but sort of an index on this graph corresponds to, you know, what's the probability the minimum price is being chosen. And you can see that there is a significant heterogeneity, right? So the location one, the, pr the price is like the most important factor in almost 70%, let's say, of the choices, whereas, you know, in location 30, it's only like, you know, whatever, 50 something, okay? Same with minimum waiting time. So in that location one, you know, the probability that the minimum waiting time is chosen is like 52%, whereas it might rise to, oh, sorry, I guess it's the right, it's the right um, axis. So it's like 25% and it rises to like 35% in location 30, okay? More importantly, perhaps the relationships are not necessarily monotone. So there is something about these areas which makes uh, people make the choice differently, potentially. Okay. So now you hopefully have some understanding where the variation is going to be coming from. Now, what I want to do, and this is actually something which uh, we have realized um, uh, there was a lot of confusion over. So I want to spend maybe three slides with defining what we mean by value of time. Okay, and how to think about how these sort of choice sets can inform you about that value of time. So imagine you are a passenger who is standing at the origin. So let's say, you know, at time T, you are at an origin and you request a cab. The cab might arrive W1 minutes later. So you have to stay at the origin. You might be doing stuff at your origin, but sort of you, the, you, the cab is going to arrive at W1. Okay, at that point, you're going to jump into the cab. It's going to take you delta units of time to get to the destination. And after that, you enjoy your time at the destination. Okay. So if you're making a choice between two traffic modes or two options for a ride, trip one and trip two, what's really the only difference? Well, if I'm instead going to be thinking about cap two, well, I have to wait a slightly more at the origin. So I get this extra gray rectangle of time at the origin, and I get slightly less at the destination, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, actually what we are gonna be able to recover is something like a net value of time. We're gonna be able to recover how people would be trading off time at the destination versus time at the origin, which is slightly different object than the value of time that you might imagine Becker is talking about and others are talking about and labor economists are talking about when they use wages. So that's one thing that's important to, to keep in mind. I'll talk more about this um, a little bit more. Okay? Um, okay, so what we are gonna think about as this net value of time object is the willingness to pay for one unit reduction in waiting at the origin. So it's literally how much am I willing to pay to move a minute from the origin to the destination? Okay, so that's sort of the, that's the object of interest. And why do we get, well, you might imagine that, you know, in transportation literature, there is all these models with ideal arrival times. And you might imagine that sometimes you actually would prefer to arrive a little later because you have something to finish at the origin. Okay, you might be in the bar finishing your beer and you know you just don't want the cab to arrive that early. Uh, and so actually the net value of time might be negative in that sort of a example. Or alternatively, you're going to the airport where you are almost about to miss your flight, at which point you really would wanna spend that minute rather at the destination than at the origin, right? So that's sort of, that's where this 
that's where this uh, value of time object is going to be coming from. Okay, so in some sense, it's the difference between the value of time at the destination and value of time at the origin. All right. Notice that this object can be location specific. Any location can serve. If you think about now these 30 locations um, in a city, any location can serve both as origin and as, as a destination. And the distributions of these things can obviously vary. You have a very different value of time to draw if you are at the airport and then if you are you know, close to your office, let's say. Okay? So these things are gonna be random. The consumers are gonna be, or passengers here are gonna be drawing these you know, randomly depending on the time of day um, or it being parameterized by time of day and location. So I'll have the equation, I guess, in, in one more slide. Okay, so if we have, suppose, bear with me for the moment and imagine you can get this net value of time, okay? So you can get from the choice sets that I've described early, you can get a dollar value that people attach to trading a minutes between destinations and origins. Um, so then, what do we do with that net value of time? Because that's not something which we really care about. Um, well, it turns out that you can identify it non-parametrically. In fact, that here I have specified a parametric form so that it's sort of an, you know, totally obvious how this would work. But it actually turns out that you could do it non-parametrically, subject to you have subject to having some sort of a rank condition and one normalization. So the easy way to think about it is again, think about this linear structure where the value at the destination is going to be, you know, the value, uh, like a depre depreciated value of the origin. Okay? So if you have that sort of a linear structure, it's not too complicated to see that if you give me a lot of these NVOTs between all pairs, right, I'm going to be able to recover these two objects subject to I have some sort of a um, normalization condition, which is going to create me a a triangular system, okay? All right, so how do I get to that net value of time? So that's, if you give me NVOTs, I know how to get VOTs. So now what remains for me to, to show you, how, how do we get to these NVOTs, okay? Now, I, by the way, I realize that this is a matching crowd. So I'm gonna get to the supply side and talk about the decisions of the passage of the drivers uh, a little bit later down the road. So just bear with me. Now we're still sort of trying to build our way to what the platform can use to set prices optimally on the passenger side. Okay? So imagine our ultimate goal is decoupling the pricing decisions. And we're trying now to understand the demand side of the platform so that, the pla so that you know, Uber could charge the right prices to passengers, leveraging the heterogeneity that they can learn, which I'm sure you all know that that's what they're trying to do. And we're going to be trying to quantify sort of how this decentralization could affect things. All right, so going back to the net value of time. So the setup is a standard, you know, in, what you should see in front of yourself is that choice set that I have shown you in that screenshot. And so basically, we are now just going to stick in all these observables that we see, the type of cars, ratings, and weather, and whatnot, and you know, waiting time and price, importantly. OK? Potentially, there might be some aggregate shock that you might worry about. So the concert is, be, is just you know, finished in Madison Square Garden. That's going to shift everybody's sort of utility one way or the other. So that's the only unobservable, really, from the econometrician's point of view, that's a little bit harder to control. Otherwise, the epsilon is really that, you know, name or picture or whatnot. So there is very little room for endogeneity of price here. Okay. <clears throat> so now what do we do about this potential aggregate shock? Well, it turns out that um, I don't have time to go into exact details how these prices are, select, but what you, uh, are selected. But what you should have in mind is that actually the driver doesn't have a full control over how to bid. It's not like the bids can be chosen from a connected support, okay? So you cannot pick any point. The way this works is because it's a cap, they have a meter in the car and they only have a finite, you know, two finite number of two part tariffs that they can choose from when they're submitting a bid, okay? It turns out, however, that the number of two part tariffs and the location, i.e. what two part tariffs to pick is not restricted. So we have some drivers who sort of specialize in driving on this platform who might have 40 two-part tariffs in their meter. And then there might be drivers who just use it occasionally who only have like two or three, okay? 
Now, this generates actually quite a useful variation. So now you might imagine that different times of days, different you know, locations, you might have different population of drivers being active. So that's going to shift around, you know, the, that's going to shift around nicely um, the price distribution that a bidder might be facing, <clears throat> sorry, um, a passenger might be facing. And we can thus use this sort of variation to construct a, like a control function approach if you want to correct for this, um, for this unobserved aggregate shocks. Okay. Very good. So now net value of time. So this is just a standard logit problem, right? Because they're going to be making a discrete choice between these options that you have seen um, on that right hand side of that screenshot. And hence, if you just estimate that logit maybe with a little bit, you know, more care needed in order to get a, um, to get that, that aggregate shock, ultimately, what you are going to be recovering is these coefficients beta, beta w and beta p. And it turns out that, of course, you know, the ratio of beta w to beta p is exactly what I care about, because that's how much in terms of, you know, that's how much the utils generated by w are worth to me. Okay, so that's the exchange rate that, that I really want. Now notice that this actually can be quite fine in the day. This can be estimated on a very fine level for us because this can be estimated at the location or origin destination time of day individual level. Now, obviously for data reasons, you might not gonna go into a very, very fine variation, but, um, but fair amount. So in particular, we're gonna allow this W, this beta W and beta P to be sort of random and correlated across passengers. Uh, we, we're just gonna restrict the H subscript to be you know, either day or night pretty much, or work, non-work, uh, rather, uh, rather than being more flexible. This model is sort of pretty easy to estimate, it turns out. So we're gonna be used, in order to get as much heterogeneity out of the data as possible, we're just gonna uh, implement it using MCM. We are gonna implement the estimation via MCMC, um, which then, because we have a panel structure, allows us to essentially recover the mean of, a rent, you know, of the distribution corresponding to each individual um, passenger in our, uh, in our data set. Okay, so this is sort of the, let me just focus, your attention to um, the important um, result from this piece. And that is something that you might have suspected already that you know, people seem to be much more price elastic than waiting time elastic, okay? So that's your first fact. People are just much more willing to wait a little bit more and get a lower price than um, to get the closest cap, okay? Uh, but that's obviously not the end of the story because there is a huge heterogeneity in this. And, and that again, that's probably something that you would have expected. You know yourself, you're going to the airport, you're just willing to get, you're probably willing to pay much more, um, you know, to go early uh, if the flight is about to leave than, uh, than to wait. And so, you know, just splitting the distributions by median, let's say, you look at people that tend to be very high uh, that tend to be very price sensitive and uh, quite a bit um, waiting time sensitive, you get, you get elasticities that are an order, almost an order of magnitude larger than people that have sort of low price elasticity and low waiting time elasticity. So this heterogeneity is, is very important. And obviously if Uber is gonna learn that about you and they are gonna have some sort of a nice predictive model that's gonna allow them to uh, you know, guess at any point in time <laughs> and based on the trip you request, which sort of a cell to put you into, there is a lot of scope to actually change the price appropriately. And that's sort of where we're going, to, that's where we're going to with this part um, of the project. So, you know, it's about, if you want, within group variation allows the price sensitivities to go up, let's say four times, waiting times about three, four times as well. Um, Again, going by you know daytime versus evening, it turns out if anything, it's it, it's true that evening hours people tend to be slightly more price elastic and less waiting time elastic. Uh, but that heterogeneity during time of day is not that important. The spatial one actually is going to turn out to be much more important. Okay, so I've mentioned before that this choice model allows us to recover this net value of time, and that net value of time plus some sort of a um, normalization or this parametric restriction and the normalization actually um, allows us to recover these values of times, which is something which 
you know, again, trade people are quite interested in. Um, and for our purposes, this is going to be very important once we put once we put the two sides together at the very end. Okay. Um, so what do we get once once we estimate from our net value of times the sort of these value of times by location? So this is a, this is a map of Prague. Not surprisingly, the darker the, the, the you know the darker the color, the higher the value of time. Now this is all in dollars now. So this is the, and, and this is sort of from the utility. Uh, everything was measured in in from our choice model. Everything was measured in minutes, right? So now we are scaling it to hours. Uh, and you know, you can think about the average wage in Prague. Let's say downtown is in the order of you know ten dollars, twelve dollars thereabouts. So um, it turns out that these, um, but obviously there is heterogeneity with education and so on. And the population of riders on this platform is not going to be your average population, not surprisingly. Um, but it turns out that these sort of measures of the value of time that this choice model gives you are actually surprisingly close to what you might think wages might look like for these people, okay? Couple other comments. You can see that sort of there is significant spatial heterogeneity. There is this sort of outskirt here. Well, that's the airport. So it turns out that there actually the value of time is quite high. This is where most of the offices are. Uh, so again, that's uh, not surprising. This is the only piece that we really have no clue why that comes out this way. But sort of most of the most of the sort of picture uh, seems to be in line. By the way, the dots and the density of the dot, each dot in this picture corresponds to a ride, right, or a request rather. So you can also use this picture to gauge sort of where most of our data is going to be taking place. So there is a lot of trips that origin. By the way, this is obviously an origin of a trip. So a lot of the trips, most of them, obviously, are going to be originating in uh, downtown. There's going to be a bunch at the upper. You just are not going to see them because they're pretty much on top of each other there. Okay. Very good. So this is um, basically then just summarizing this previous map um, in terms of a table. Okay. So on average, we estimate the value of time to be about $17 per hour during work time and about $14 per hour during non-work time, but with a standard deviation, which is quite significant. So there is a lot of heterogeneity. So you might imagine that there is going to be a lot of across individual variation and very likely also within an individual variation. I guess, again, if you engage in a little bit of introspection, this is something which probably you would have expected. Sometimes you just really need to get there. Sometimes you are a little bit more flexible. Okay. Um, so what to take away? is again significant heterogeneity but we can put a number on that and so now what we are interested in is trying to look at it a little bit more so the first thing that we can start doing is do you know what the label literature has done um, this akm type of a decomposition right so we want to know how much of the surplus or how much of the you know um, value can be attributed to um um, places, how much of it can be attributed to individuals and, and, and time potentially. So it turns out that most of the variation that we see, if you do that sort of a decomposition, is going to be coming uh, from individuals. Okay? So it's really not that it, all the high value traps originate here. So that just knowing the location is going to be almost a sufficient statistic for the value of time, that's definitely not going to be the case. Most of the variance is actually because of individuals. Okay, but there is also going to be a lot of within heterogeneity, which you know we don't, which we obviously cannot do using the AKM. Okay, now in trade and transportation in particular, very frequently the net value or the value of time is a very important input in many decisions. Right, when you are sort of setting fines for construction delays and so on, you probably would want to know what. Uh, how much surplus is destroyed by having a particular closure. So unfortunately, the value of time numbers are obviously not something that the transportation uh, guys have at their disposal. So they typically use travel flows with the idea uh, being, I guess, that you know the more travel there is uh, through a certain route, the more important it is. Okay. So you might imagine taking our measures of VOT or NVOT and correlating it with travel, travel flows. And indeed, you get you get something which is, you know, upward sloping. So there is some positive correlation. So this, this is this certainly makes sense, 
if you don't have the value of time data to use the travel flows as a, as a potential substitute, but it's far from perfect, okay? So this graph shows you the scatter plot, that those are the, the, the circles, and then the bin scatter, these white diamonds, uh, where, you know, between the NVOT for an origin and destination pair, so this is now a fairly fine grained, um, and then sort of the, the respective share of traffic between those two um, origin, between that origin destination pair. Okay, same, um, again, in the same spirit, um, you might imagine thinking about whether real estate prices might be informative about these values of times. So again, you get some positive relationship, um, but it's sort of far from straight line and it's, it's you know, it's just there is a positive correlation. So if you don't have values of time, indeed, uh, using land values might be a reasonable substitute um, if you need to work with that. Okay, so now we're getting into the meat. So we have done the demand. Now I'm going to talk about the supply, and then we're going to put them together and think about how the how this market actually is going to work once we sort of allow the platform to decouple. So let, let's go through the supply model. That's going to be probably more fun for the theorists among you and econometricians as well. So again, the key ingredients on the supply side is that we're going to be thinking about the driver's dynamic decision, right? And we're going to be thinking about the optimal bidding. Uh, so, you know, we are, in, you are engaging in an auction here for a passenger. So you're sort of coming up with beliefs about what other drivers are around you, and they're going to try to optimize against what you think they might be bidding, okay? Uh, so the main trade-off is really, do I bid more aggressively, and hence, do I lower my surplus, or do I actually, um, you know, just wait for a passenger that is going to be willing to pay a lot and I, I just roll my dice that there is no competition over him. Okay. By the way, I should have said quite at the onset, the way the platform operates at the status quo currently is that they collect a 10% fee from the bid that the passenger accepts. Okay. So right now there's that auction, passenger makes the choice and the platform gets a 10% cut. What we, are, what we are ultimately going for at the end today um, or rather in our, I guess, second part of this project is we allow the platform to completely decouple these two things. And we just wanna sort of ask, well, how would the platform optimally procure the drivers and how would they optimally charge the passengers rather than potentially him? So this is, that's your Uber model, if you want, more or less. It's not quite the Uber model because the Uber model, instead of procuring the lowest opportunity cost driver, what they do is they pretty much, you know, ping the closest guy and ask, do you want the ride, right? Which again, you might imagine is quite inefficient as we're going to hopefully get to towards the very end. So the big benefit of the platform in the way I see it, at least in this example, is that the driver's competition allows you to get a sense of the opportunity cost of the different drivers. So it might not be that the closest driver is the best one to assign to a ride because there is another driver that actually wants to go to that destination that that passenger is going. So his opportunity cost may be very different, okay? And the auction allows you to learn that. Whereas Uber currently has, Uber's business model has currently no way how to find that out. Um, okay, so here is the dynamic problem of a driver, okay? So we're sitting at the location A at some time and we have drawn some outside payoff omega. So there is some probability, you, you know, there is some potential street hail that somebody wants to, um, wants to get. And so now my value of being at a location with a particular value of my outside option is gonna compo be composed of two things. So think about, time, think about time periods as being discrete and you know, very fine. Okay? Um, then with some probability, I might get a ping from the platform. So the platform is gonna send me a request to submit a bit. So I'm gonna call that Delta here, okay? If you get a ping, well, you are at a destination, you are at an origin A. You don't know yet what that ping is gonna be. So you're averaging over, well, there's gonna be all kinds of destinations they're gonna send me to, and it's gonna take me tau to get to that destination. So this averaging over all these destinations tells me what's the value of getting a random ping while being at a location A, okay? If I don't get allocate, if I don't get pinked before transitioning to the next period, I can do, I can sort of collect my continuation value. And if I collect my continuation value, then I can, you know, 
continue to some other location, maybe empty or, you know, maybe that continuation value forces me to go there or whatever. Okay. So I'm again, averaging to where I'm going to be tau hat periods ahead where tau hat sort of depends on, you know, maybe the omega and, and, um, what you choose to do. So there is, you can see that there's going to be a couple of value functions that we're interested in. One is this value of being at a location with an outside payoff. And the other value function is going to be the value of a pink at a location, you know, going to a destination A, given that I have some outside option omega. All right. So let's talk about this H part now. So this H part, the value of actually having a pink for a ride to some destination A prime. Well, what is that? Well, now the auction comes into play. So if I get that pink, I can submit a bit. And with that bit, I might actually win. Okay, so with probability P, I'm gonna win the auction. In which case, what do I get? Well, I get my bit. I have, it's, a, it's like a first price. I submit the fare. That's the fare I'll collect minus some fee that the platform takes. Okay, think about this as being 0.9 of the fare is how much I collect because I have to pay the 10% fee. And then I go to the destination. It's going to take me tau periods to get to the destination. And there I'm going to get some new outside option draw. Okay. So that's if I win. If I don't win, well, then I'll just collect my outside option and again, you know, decide what to do, move somewhere or stay. Okay. So that's the setup. Now you can see that sort of, it looks sort of intimidating, but it turns out that it's actually, it's actually quite simple. Because if you just define an object C by collecting a bunch of terms in this equation that I, you know, so basically I have just walked you through all these terms right now, I'm just rearranging stuff. So this is just, you know, told this is nothing. It's just rearranging stuff and defining a function as by collecting a bunch of terms after I rearrange stuff and voila, you get back an equation, which would, which should look very similar, very familiar, right? So this is your first price auction equation. So, you know, I have some, if I'm bidding for a construction, this is my cost of serving, you know, building that bridge. And I'm thinking about how big, you know, what bit am I going to submit in a first price yield bid auction? Okay. Now that's beautiful because what that tells me is that if you give me a distribution of these bits, you know, I can identify the C's, right? I can identify the cost distribution. That's what Gary and Wong told us, uh, told us a long time ago. Okay. So therefore, I can, I can get an important ingredient into those value functions just from seeing these bits, okay? So I'm gonna invert them and get these Cs. Now the Cs, it turns out that it's still not a totally trivial object because it's, it has this continuation value and then a couple of expectations. But the beauty of expectations is that, well, they can be pretty much taken out by a bunch of fixed effect regressions, okay? So what that means is that if after you recover the Cs, the pseudo cost, or which, which is what it's sometimes cost, uh, called in um, the auction and particular auction literature. Uh, well, projecting these pseudo costs on location and destination fixed effects allows you to get back the omegas essentially. And once you have the omegas, you have everything that you need because you have a location specific distribution of the outside option. And that's really the key to understand the driver's incentives at that point. So now, we can start thinking about um, how to change the pricing. Okay, so now I'm gonna pause for a little bit if there is any question um, before I go on uh, before I go on with this. Okay, makes sense. Very good. So again, so we have we're recovering these opportunity costs, which are gonna be location, origin, and destination specific. Okay. Part of those opportunity costs are going to be also these, um, um, right? So these opportunity costs, omega, which are going to be then, um, which we can use to construct a distribution of opportunity cost that corresponds to a location. Okay. Um, all right. Um, very good. So once you do that, you get back a distribution. So this is what I've just said, the distribution of drivers opportunity cost. And you can see again that the drivers actually, this is opportunity cost per minute. Let's say my T, my time period was a minute. Um, this is obviously, a, this is a, a choice. So then 
the opportunity cost per minute varies by hour of the day quite substantially. That's sort of the first observation, for example, the drivers, you know, in the middle of the day, you know, they tend to have a much lower opportunity cost than in the middle of the night. So the idea here is that, you know, you're sitting at, you know, downtown uh, in front of the bars, right? And sort of, you know, if, if I'm gonna think, if I think about taking a particular ride and drive somewhere to the boonies, well, I might think twice because there might be a guy who actually just wants to go from one bar to another, which is obviously a much more, you know, valuable to me than being tossed out to somewhere where I have no way of getting a new ride. Okay, so this is sort of makes sense. Now, the other thing that you can take away from this picture, the top line is the opportunity cost of all the drivers. So that's all the submitted bids, okay, on average. And this is the average of the first order statistics. So this is the average of the cheapest, or sorry, of the accepted, not the cheapest, I shouldn't have said that, but sort of that's the average of the accepted ride. Now, because bits are going to be monotone in the opportunity cost, not surprisingly, very frequently we're picking the cheapest, hence very frequently we're picking the guy with the lowest opportunity cost. So that's why it's, it's it, but it doesn't have to be this way because sometimes it might be a guy, the cheapest guy might not be the guy who is chosen, right? Um, because sometimes I might prefer to get the closest guy who is actually not the cheapest. That was the whole point of our demand part in the beginning, okay? So the opportunity cost, of drivers is roughly at the order of 12 to $20. But again, with a lot of variation and the opportunity cost of winners is six to $15. And now this goes back to what I've said a minute ago. If you think about Uber's problem currently, they sort of assign this closest driver. Well, looking at this figure tells you that that might not be from the welfare perspective, the way to go, because there might be guys with much lower opportunity cost of serving that ride which just don't get even asked. And there is no language that allows these drivers to actually express their values for, for their time, more or less. I mean, Uber has started with that one, you know, I guess they now have an option to sort of say which direction they wanna go, maybe twice a day or something like that, I can't remember, but sort of they can now express their preferences a little bit by sort of saying, I wanna go towards a particular destination because of their home or work or whatnot. So that goes a little bit in this direction. Um, and if any of you is working with Uber data, I guess that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, direction to think about whether there is, you know, how much of a welfare gain can you actually achieve by introducing that sort of language into the choice, into say the, uh, the driver's um, choices. Because otherwise, currently, what, what, what they're doing is just basically up or down, right? They get asked, they don't know the destination, and they have to take the right or not. And then, you know, I'm sure some of you, you know, who, well, I guess you guys who live in New York probably don't face that. But for us living in, in South Jersey, what happened fairly frequently was that you would, you would request an Uber at Newark. And once the guy finds out that you want to go to, you know, Mercer County, they're like, oh, sorry, you know, I'm here, but you're not there. I'm not going to be waiting for you, right? So they try to call you. They try to figure out where you're going. And once they realize that you're going somewhere where they don't want to go, they somehow stand you up. But of course, they don't want to they, they don't want to cancel the ride because they would get punished. So what they do is they say they actually arrived, even though they have never arrived and, and sort of wait until you cancel the ride. So there's all these inefficiencies that get interjected in that market because of this lack of destination-based pricing and lack of language that the drivers can be using. Here, there is destination-based pricing because you are auctioning off a particular ride. So you know where you're gonna be going. So you can optimize over all of that. So there is definitely much more scope for um, you know, realizing the welfare gains from the optimal match. Jakub, sorry to interrupt you. You have a little yeah. bit less than 10 minutes now. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I have like two slides, so. I'm doing much better on time than I thought. I speak even faster than I usually do, I guess. Okay, so now uh, the application. So now I've told you about the demand side. That was how we recover the value of time. And we talked about how, you know, that, that, that there is a lot of heterogeneity. So I'm gonna try to quantify the impact of price discrimination um, and how a platform could price discriminate. And on the other side, I have talked about the heterogeneity in the opportunity cost. So now what we want is to put these two things together. So now that's sort of the holy grail. We're not there yet, 
Okay, we're, I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be showing you a counterfactual where we reoptimize the drivers completely. Instead, what I'm going to be doing now is actually play some sort of a what if game. So I'm going to try to pretend that the platform actually decouples the prices, but sets the incentives in a way that the drivers behave exactly in the way we see them behaving in the data. Okay, so the drivers still bid in the way we see them bidding, but it's only the platform who sees the bids. So the platform can immediately recover the opportunity cost of every single driver by monotonicity, okay? And then decides which guy do I want to sort of serve the right. This might, at the end of the day, this might actually change the distribution of drivers um, and the rely, because we're gonna be playing with prices, it might change also obviously the set of rights they get realized, which ultimately might change the continuation values uh, in that whole equilibrium game. Now, because you're going to be engaging in price discrimination, presumably to raise your profits, there is going to be a piece of the pie that you can use to redistribute to the drivers so that to bring the continuation values back to these initial values that we start with now. So that's the game we're playing. We're not going to be upsetting the driver's incentives. We're going to be thinking about increasing our profits from the demand side. And because we're going to be changing quantity and potentially also spatial distribution of the realized rights. We're going to be using that extra money we make to set the incentives back to that status quo. Does that make sense? So that's the game. So we're not going all the way to the equilibrium yet. We're just now trying to gauge how much, this is like a lower bound, how much you can gain as a platform, right? Because now you might do even better after you sort of uh, don't force yourself to bring the continuation back or continuation values back to the initial stage. All right, um, right, so this, I should have moved to that bottom part. This is what I've just said in words, okay? So we're gonna be shutting down now the spatial relocation of drivers because of pricing by just making sure that we take part of that pie and redistribute it back to keep the continuation values constant. So this, this is sort of the last table before I, before I go to conclusion, so, but, but it's, it might be a bit uh, dense. So let me use a couple uh, of these lines uh, to just explain that. <clears throat> okay, so what we're interested here, what we're interested in here is literally a couple of things. We currently know uh, that the drivers can, they pick their bits in any way they want, okay? So now, because we have decoupled the pricing, we can have the platform choose a monopoly price. So let's focus on this line here, which would be the result of platform knowing the demand structure, as we have estimated in that first half of the talk, and choosing a two-part tariff, which is sort of a flat, you know, flag down fee and a per, you know, mile fee, um, um, in a way that would maximize its profits, where we take into account the fact that there is going to be, the quantity is going to be quite impacted because the average price is going up, okay? And second, the cost, obviously might be impacted because you might be using different caps, okay? So what we get from this choice, uh, from this change, from the data to the monopoly pricing, well, we get the net revenue going up from 0.55 per request to like $0.79 per request, okay? By the way, the, the way to scale this right, I guess, think about there being approximately a million, or, a million requests, so this results in about uh, half a million, you know, profits or something, okay? Half a million dollar profits. If you went to the monopoly pricing, you would get eight hundred thousand dollar profits. Okay, so this is a sixty percent increase or something like that. Yeah, Jakob, uh, yeah. One, yeah. one quick clarifying question: mm -hmm. When you talk about monopoly pricing, mm -hmm. monopoly pricing taking what as a cost? Because the I mean, it really depends on drivers the drivers' opportunity. Exactly, the yeah. drivers' opportunity cost. So. Remember that's we, we hold the supply side as fixed. Right. Okay. Right. Now I can choose whomever I give you. Sometimes I'm I'm very likely gonna give you the cheapest guy, right? And I'll pay him 90% of his bid because I'm not upsetting the supply side incentives. He's gonna be bidding the same way as I see him bidding. Okay. And in the current equilibrium, we have to pay them 90% of their bid. So I keep that. Okay? I see. So there is no double marginalization, right? Because uh, if you take the uh, bid 
submitted by drivers as your cause, then what you end up choosing is not the joint monopoly ma profit maximization, but rather your own, right? So. Well, and, I guess and, there might be double marginalization. It's just that it's on, you know, you're averaging over all these costs and then you're adding a fee on top of that. So I'm not quite sure how to think about double marginalization in this sort of a spatial setup, but it seems like, it seems to me that there is going to be a double marginalization because the, the drivers are picking, you know, the drivers are bidding above their opportunity cost. So that's margin one. And then the platform is setting a price such that the price they collect from consumers is above the opportunity, above the, you know what they're paying to the to the drivers so there is going to be i thought that the monopoly pricing according to you was set using the opportunity cost as the cost so you are not really oh fair enough yes yes yeah. fair enough yeah you there is no more slope there yes um okay so that's sort of the difference you could sort of gain if you went to monopoly price now it might not be as easy to go that way because these markets are regulated so because there is a cap that the regulator imposes, if you actually went all the way, if you took that cap as binding, and basically that's what you would charge as the platform. So now you're just a matchmaker and you're just choosing the, you know, the lowest opportunity cost guy and then operating at a cap at the passenger side, you see the profits would still go up, but much less. So maybe 15% or whatever that order is. Okay, so um, much, much less. Okay, but now the interesting stuff. We talked about heterogeneity on the sub on the demand side. So you might imagine now leveraging the fact that some people are willing to pay a lot. And in particular, because a lot of these trips are downtown, they're gonna be short. And so there is potentially a lot of scope for you know charging these business people a little bit more. So imagine we engage in a very simple scheme where we just charge a surcharge for getting making sure you get the cheapest, uh, the closest cap. So the way you should think about it is you open the app and it asks you, do you want the cheapest or do you want the closest? And if you decide you want to go to, or rather, do you want the closest or do you want us to assign you something? If you are going to, if you're going to pay extra to get the closest cap, you're going to have to pay the surcharge. And after that, you get an expected waiting time, which is obviously lower than the expected waiting time if you uh, face the, um, the, the choice that the platform gives you, okay? Now, so that's sort of what the uh, surcharge column tells you. So in these three counterfactuals, we ran this sort of a second degree price discrimination routine. The difference between, I guess let's, let's uh, I mean, in the interest of time, let me not talk about that. Let's just focus on that, maybe that last row here. So again, we're just gonna allow you to choose the closest cap if you pay a surcharge. It turns out that <clears throat> many people with a very high value of time are gonna pick that, okay? So on average, people whose value of time is like $15 would pick that option. Um, it turns out that the number of trips, however, you cannot see it in this picture, in this, in this table, but the number of trips that actually get selected into that surcharge is not that high. But there, is a, there, there are guys in that downtown, you know, it might be of the order of few percent of all the rides. But it turns out that it has a significant impact on the revenues, this two-part tariff structure, okay? Um, because it turns out that the revenues almost double relative to the status quo, and they go up by another, whatever, 20% relative to, uh, relative to um, you know, just the pure monopoly pricing with one two-part tariff, okay? So anyway, so I guess I'm out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it here. But this is sort of the, this, it's obviously a work in progress, but this is sort of where this thing, this thing is going. So the first project is if you have quantifying that value of time and really micro founding it a little bit and talk about how this sort of data, decentralized data or decentralized platform data can be used to get a really good sense of values on both sides. And then the second project that we're working on now is really about finding that special equilibrium um after you endogenize all these objects once okay thank you so much so that jacob um so we do have a little bit of time for questions awesome. so, there i'm any... sure laura answered all of them yeah 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 actually there was many questions during that talk i could see you are doing a great job no so in that case yeah let's thank uh, jacob again and um so we'll meet in 15 minutes we're taking a break and then Mohamed will be presenting afterwards.
Thanks a lot again. While you prepare your uh, slide sharing, let me just remind uh, the audience, or for those who just arrived, the way in which we're trying to organize this is to have uh, mainly clarification questions as li live questions. Otherwise, you'll ask the questions ideally in the in the chat, and co-authors can answer during the during the talk. And we'll keep some time at the very end uh, to have uh, additional questions. Um, so overall, you have 50, 55 minutes, uh, Mohamed. And I'll let you know 10 minutes in advance. Uh, um, after 45 minutes. Um, okay, so are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I would be happy. I would be happy to take questions as we go through. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, so we're happy to have Mohamed uh, Akbapu from Stanford. And so, yeah, let's try. So, you have 55 minutes, so the floor is yours, Mohamed. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia and uh, Kyungko, for inviting me and everyone else involved. Uh, I'm going to talk about this paper. I was looking at the list of papers in the conference, and all of them I've seen uh, between one year ago and like, three years ago, the papers have been out. This paper is really new. So uh, I'm really, uh, we are really eager to get feedback. It's, it's like a month old. So it's going to change a lot in the in the months and years to come. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, three fantastic co-authors, all of whom from a Shapley value perspective should get more contribution value and credit than me. Shengu and Amin are uh, two of my favorite scientists and Yegane who is here uh, is a fantastic Stanford student. One of the reasons I'm happy to be a professor is to learn from students like Yegane who is an amazing mathematician and a creative student. If you have any hard questions, ask her, she's gonna answer. Uh, I'm gonna answer easy questions. Uh, perfect. Uh, so the story of this paper is about uh, uh, matching, as, as you can see from the title of the paper. And the story is that there are many platforms who match service providers to, to requests. Uh, you could think of riders and drivers as the leading example for this for this talk uh, in a ride sharing platform and uh, providers and requesters all of them have locations geographical locations it's a spatial market and closer matches are better okay like one example of such situation is ride hailing in which uh, you want to match drivers to to closer passengers or you want to minimize total distance cost, if you like. Uh, and you can come up with other examples, like matching ambulances to emergencies and so on and so forth. In a very metaphoric fashion, you could think of uh, matching projects to people in a, in a consulting company uh, too, but I don't want to stretch it as much. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, this, that's a very standard spatial uh, situation and in, and, in, and and when you think about uh, a dynamic environment in which requests are coming over time and you want to match uh, your supply to the request the drivers to the riders or riders to the drivers uh, you uh, you by the way this rider and driver should uh, you you typically face a pretty complex optimization problem uh, because I mean, requests come dynamically, you don't know the future. I mean, on top of that, the, even the question of who to match typically depends on the whole network structure. So when Uber is making a decision to match you to someone, they should look at the location of all drivers all over the network. Uh, and matching you to the closest driver is not necessarily the optimal decision to do. And in addition to that, there is this like second question of uh, when to match agents uh, and I mean, we know that recently these platforms have all uh, switched to algorithms that thinks very carefully about the, the batching and frequency of matching. And in general, you are dealing with a, with a question that's uh, non-obvious. I mean, this is the recent improvement in Uber. You can just go to their website and they say that, look, we used to do first to request matching, in which case driver one was, this driver was matched to this passenger one and this driver was matched to passenger two. If we wait for a few seconds for passenger two to show up in the system, then we can do a better matching and that's what they are doing now. Okay, so this just issue of timing is also, I mean, uh, an issue that they are thinking about. 
And what I want to emphasize here is that it's a it's it's, it's generally not an easy problem. There are, there, are, there are big teams in these companies working on this problem. Uh, what we are going to do here is to ask a slightly different question instead of asking uh, how does the optimal matching look like. Uh, we are going to ask uh, about the value of excess supply. In particular, how does the per performance of a matching algorithm change as we increase the supply? Okay, so suppose you start from a market in which you have equal number of drivers and passengers. As you increase the number of drivers in your platform, which has a clear cost for the platform, I have to pay them, I have to hire them. Uh, how you are changing the performance of the matching algorithm? Is it a linear change? Is it a nonlinear change? And so on and so forth. That's that's basically the question uh, we are going to ask to quantify uh, this this value. You could think of it as a uh, quote unquote euro clamper question in this context. Instead of running the optimal auction uh, with n bidders, uh, we are going to run the a simple auction with with some more bidders and see how many more bidders we need uh, to beat the optimal auction uh, now here in a different context. Uh, I'm going to jump into the model. Uh, Olivia, whenever there are questions, let me know, you can ask. Uh, so here's the model. It's, it's a pretty simple model and it fits into one slide. So I'm going to go slowly. And if there is two minutes in this talk, you want to follow me, it's this. Uh, so time is discrete. Uh, I have N drivers who are distributed uniformly at random on a zero one interval. Okay, uh, this could be generalized to non uniform distributions. Uh, there are generalizations we are working on and that we are not sure this is not one of them actually this this, this you can you can consider any distribution of uh, drivers. There are M riders uh, who arrive into the system one each period. Uh, they are also distributed uniformly on, on zero one interval. Uh, the arrival process could be anything. As I, sh I will show you the analysis, you could have random arrival, uh, you could have adversarial ar arrival, and all the results will go through uh, for that. Uh, but the distribution of the location of riders is just uniformly at random, or in general, it's the same distribution as drivers. Okay, that's the assumption that we need that roughly speaking you have uh, the same mass of uh, drivers uh, if there is a part of the city that is super crowded in terms of demand you have more drivers in the same part of the city too okay that's that's the thing that that we need uh, now the platform assigns riders to drivers in an uh, irrevocable fashion you can wait pay a cost c until you assign a driver uh, and the distance cost, cost of matching a rider R to a driver D is just the Euclidean distance. Okay, so here's an example. I have these drivers, a passenger or a rider. I'm gonna use rider versus passenger uh, uh, frequently and change them. I mean the same thing. A passenger shows up, you can decide to match them. Uh, another passenger shows up, you can say, oh, I'm gonna wait for a period for another passenger to show up. And now, I'm going to match this passenger to the one on the right and this passenger to the one on the left, uh, to the one on the right of that, that, that passenger, uh, and so on and so forth. So if there are questions about the model, I would be happy to take them because that's pretty much all of the model. Or you can ask. Yagana. So what do you mean by adversarial order? Order relative to, in terms of the location? No, the lo uh, 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 that's a very good question. Thanks. The, lo the location is fixed. Uh, it's fixed ex ante. So the nature draws the location. It's random, but the, the nature draws the location at time zero. The platform does not observe the location. I could imagine that these M riders, uh, each one of them shows up, uh, like the, the one that shows up in period one is picked uniformly at random among all the riders, the one that shows up in period two. Uh, or I could imagine there is an adversary who wants to kill me. The adversary knows the algorithm that I'm running uh, as the platform and then is going to enter, ask, ask riders to enter one by one in order to maximize my total cost. Uh, that's what I mean. But it's not gonna make any difference. You could imagine that each period a rider shows up in a uniformly at random location uh, for, for time being, but 
the reason I put it here is that there is, there is a branch of the literature on uh, optimal matching that focuses on adversarial order. And we know that the optimal algorithms are different for adversarial than random uh, orders of arrival. Uh, what I will show you here actually is robots with respect to both. both. Perfect. Uh, there are no more questions, I'm gonna move on. So that's a model, uh, kind of a pretty, uh, pretty but relatively simple model of spatial, uh, spatial matching. What is a matching algorithm? A matching algorithm takes as input uh, the position of all drivers who are, who are currently in the system, potentially drivers who have been in the system before. If I have an adversary, then I care about that too. But, uh, but that's, that's, in general, you know the position of all the drivers. That's what platform knows. The platform knows the position of all the riders who have arrived so far. And then as a function of these two, I'm gonna output an, 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 an assignment of drivers to ride, riders this period. This could be empty too. I could decide to wait and, and get more information and then match people, which is what, for example, Uber does for, for, for like 15 to 30 seconds. Okay, now the optimal matching algorithm is the matching algorithm that just minimizes the total waiting cost plus distance cost. Okay. I, can, I can write it mathematically for you. In fact, I will do it for you for one of my algorithms, but uh, it's, 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 it's what you wanna do. Okay. Now you can see more why this problem is complex, right? I mean, we have dynamic arrival of requests, future is unknown. Even the problem of who to match is, is kind of non-obvious. I mean, I can, I can have uh, a passenger here, a driver here, and then a bunch of drivers here, uh, and then a driver here. Even in this simple example, it's really non-obvious who is your optimal match. You could match me to this guy who is closer, but then this space would be pretty empty for the next, for the next period. You could match me to this guy, it's further. Or you could wait, and once the next driver showed up here, then you're like, okay, now I can do a better job. I know I have more information. So it's a, it's, 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 it's at least it's not obvious, uh, and it's a function of the bipartite graph of drivers and passengers at each point in time. Uh, so, and we, we, we honestly, we, we even don't know how to analyze the opt, we don't know what is the opt. I mean, uh, anyone who has comments about the properties of the opt, we would be happy to hear. Uh, so instead of analyzing the optimum algorithm, uh, we are going to analyze uh, an algorithm that is better than optimum uh, in order to get a sense of how, how this system works. And what is this algorithm that is better than optimum? Suppose Uber and Lyft, have the best data scientists of the world and they can predict perfectly the location and the time of arrival of future requests. Okay, that's like the ideal situation. I know exactly over the course of the, the day or the hour, uh, where are the, how many drive, how many requests are gonna show up, where are the locations of the requests at what time. On top of that, suppose I have unlimited computational power so that I can de facto solve the ex post optimal matching. So I know the location of all the drivers, I know the location of all the riders, uh, two hours from now, equipped with that information, I'm gonna solve the optimal match. Okay, this is just better than optimum uh, by, by, by construction. And this is uh, easy to compute in a way because it's, it's just a linear, it's just an integer program. Okay, you want to minimize the total distance uh, subject to uh, these integer constraints. You wanna match all the riders, you wanna match all the drivers uh, by choosing zero ones. And the reason I don't have a waiting cost C in this optimization is that the, a key feature of the omniscient algorithm is that it matches all riders immediately. Okay? Because I'm looking at the system exposed, I know that the best match for Philip's request that's gonna show up in like 1.05 p.m. is that driver exposed. So there is no reason for me to wait. I'm gonna keep that driver until Philip shows up and I immediately match him. I mean, that's not what you can do in practice, but if, if you had all that information, that's, that's what you're gonna do, right? But uh, until that happens, you have to wait, right? 
uh, the, the the driver waits. Philip doesn't wait. Yes. See, so the wait, waiting costs are incurred only by the riders. Yes, that's one of the simplifications we have here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there is no waiting cost uh, that that uh, that enters my objective function for the omniscient algorithm because I know you're gonna match immediately. Uh, and and moreover, this this algorithm is kind of uh, too good to be true or amazing because it's detail free. It's independent of the arrival process. Random adversarial doesn't matter. In in either case, you uh, you you have the information exposed. Uh, you know exactly who is the optimal match for Philip, who is the optimal match for Olivia, and so on. Uh, the waiting cost. Uh, C is, is, is irrelevant here, uh, so it doesn't matter whether you have a waiting cost. In fact, you could even have some discount rate. It doesn't matter because the algorithm has, has no waiting time. You could even have departure. You could imagine that if I come to Uber and Uber does not match me for three minutes, I'm going to leave. I haven't modeled it, but if I had departure, still omniscient algorithm is insensitive to that because I'm going to match you immediately. Okay, so this algorithm is kind of a pretty amazing algorithm in this sense. Good. Questions about the omniscient? Perfect. So uh, this is the omniscient. It's going to choose the best possible matching exposed. Uh, and here is the question I'm going to ask uh, in the first result and show you the first theorem, which is, suppose we start from a quote unquote balanced market meaning equal number of drivers and passengers. Uh, the question I'm going to ask is, what is the value of adding a few more drivers uh, to the omniscient algorithm? Okay, so if I start from a balanced market and then I add a few drivers, how much I improve the performance of the algorithm? That's a question. It's kind of, as I said, similar to uh, both Itai, Yash, and Jacobs uh, Unbalanced random matching market paper, as well as the view of emperor type of type of questions. And here is the first main theorem. Uh, let me go through that uh, slowly. Uh, suppose you have uh, n riders and n drivers that are de facto two sets of independent random uniform points on zero one. Uh, for the omniscient algorithm, I have no dynamics really. I have a static problem. Uh, I have n points as the riders. I have n points as the drivers, uh, independently uniformly distributed. Then, uh, in a balanced market that m is equal to n, there exists a constant c uh, such that uh, the cost of the omniscient algorithm uh, is at least c root n. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I could extend this theorem and show you that actually this is also less than some other constant C prime uh, root n. As a result, this is exactly order uh, root n. This is theta of root n as computer scientists uh, write. Uh, so the cost of the omniscient algorithm is of the order root n in a balanced market. It with, the, with all the information that, that you have about the future arrivals of riders and their location, uh, the cost, uh, the rate by which costs increases as you increase the number of participants in the platform cannot be lower than root n. However, if I'm in an unbalanced market in which I have epsilon percent more drivers, it, and this, 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 could, this works for any epsilon, then there is a constant, which is a function of how small is the epsilon, uh, such that the cost of the omniscient algorithm is actually a constant. Okay. So this is independent of n, actually. Uh, so uh, adding a few more drivers uh, is going to move, uh, at least theoretically. I mean, you could always wonder how big is this C, how big is this C, I mean, as well, for real world or reasonable numbers, uh, do these constants make sense? But at least from a theoretical perspective, I had a I had an interesting regime change that I moved from a regime of increasing costs with rate root n to a regime that my total cost is independent of the number of players in the system. Uh, it's a constant cost. Cool. 
food. Questions, concerns, perfect. Uh, so it, it suggests, I mean, I will show you simulations uh, that these numbers are actually, uh, that they make sense. I mean, adding like four more drivers uh, is going to be in a, in a market with a hundred uh, riders, adding four more drivers is going to be like hugely valuable. Uh, we will see that it's going to be very valuable. Uh, but in, 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 in principle, what this theorem shows is a stark reduction uh, in cost with a small excess supply. Good. So uh, the challenge or the, the practical uneasiness uh, we had with this theorem is that uh, it's, it's, it shows that it's really valuable to add a few more drivers if you are running the omniscient algorithm. And the omniscient algorithm is not an option on the table. I mean, I, I don't have all this information that I need to run this algorithm. So the question is how much of this gain I can realistically achieve? Uh, and which gets us closer to a, to a Bueller Kalemperer style type of result. So we are going to design an algorithm which is pretty simple and naive. I'm gonna call it the greedy algorithm. It's an algorithm that matches each driver. Uh, there is a question by, uh, I don't know, I saw a hand raised. Okay, uh, if there was a question, let me know. Uh, the, the greedy algorithm uh, matches each rider immediately when the rider arrives to the closest driver. Okay, that's, that's, that's naive because it ignores the network structure, it ignores the, the fact that you can wait and so on and so forth. Uh, so, I mean, my bullets were reversed. So the question I wanted to ask is, is excess supply valuable only with access to perfect foresight and unlimited computational power, or I can do better? And greedy algorithm is gonna help me answer that question. It's a naive algorithm. I can run it on, on any platform. It's a pretty easy algorithm to run. It matches riders immediately. Okay, again, uh, just like uh, the omniscient algorithm, it's independent of waiting cost C. In fact, it's independent of if I had discounting or if I had departure, the really algorithm is insensitive to that because I immediately match uh, Olivier when, when he requests. So there is no uh, cost of that type. Okay. Uh, so greedy is naive. Let me, let me show you an example. I mean, I'm sure all of you can come up with an example in two minutes uh, why greedy is naive, but this passenger shows up uh, I mean, I decide to match you to the driver on the left, who is a slightly closer. Uh, and then the next passenger shows up. Uh, ideally, I would love to match this new passenger to the one that I already matched you to, but I can, so I have to match you here. And because of this overlap, you can see that this is this is suboptimal. The optimal matching was uh, was was not this one. It was this one. Okay, uh, so it's naive, it makes mistakes. Uh, yet, uh, we can prove that with one minus epsilon, epsilon percent more drivers, uh, the cost of the greedy algorithm uh, is at most uh, of the order log 3n. It's polylog in n. Uh, so remember, the cost of the omniscient algorithm in balanced market was root n. The cost of the omniscient algorithm in, in this unbalanced market was a constant. And what this theorem is showing that you move uh, not all the way here, uh, but you probably move uh, a lot of the way from root n to constant uh, through a simple naive algorithm that has access to a few more drivers. I mean, but by a few more. I mean, I should be careful. It's proportionally more drivers, and these are limit results. I mean, it's the, it's, the theorem is right, as you see. Uh, so it's proportional more drivers. Uh, in the limit, it's like infinitely more drivers. Uh, but it's a way for us to, to get uh, meaningful theorems. Uh, and then in, you can do simulations and see how many more drivers you actually need in order for the greedy to be better than the omniscient and so on. One question, is this the to the power of three? Does it mean log to the power of three here or three times applied the log? No, it's uh, log of n uh, to power three. Thank you. 
It's log of n times log of n times log. Of. So in what sense is this a limit lizard? It seems like this is true for all n, right? Oh, yes, this is true for all n. Yeah, the, yeah it's not the limit result, really. It's, it's, it's just that, uh, yeah, this constant could be arbitrarily large in a way. So whether it makes sense for practical application is that it, the, from this theorem, the jury is out. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but the constant is independent of n. So in this sense, it's a limit result that for very large values of n, this term is the term that dominates. Uh, uh, Mohammed, I just wanted to point out a question from Nikki that mm -hmm. uh, it seems that uh, he says that it seems a number of uh, drivers that needed to be increased that need to be added is in increasing with n. So if we had a cost of having more drivers, that could be the case that it doesn't make sense to add more drivers. So yes, that's true. So the number of extra drivers is epsilon n. Uh, uh, and if you're paying some, if you're paying some wage for each one of them, uh, then then this is your extra cost uh, for 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 your extra drivers. And you could say that look in the limit, this term dominates uh, and is much bigger than that term. Maybe you don't want to add as many more drivers uh, in the limit. Uh, that's a good question. And, uh, the, the, the true question is how many how many extra drivers you actually need. I mean, it's if it's if you want to read this as a limit result, then this this criticism is completely right. But uh, if with two more drivers, I can actually beat the omniscient, then uh, maybe the platform can afford two more drivers uh, to to avoid prediction and computation. There was another question. Sorry, I, uh, maybe you mentioned this at the beginning, and I had to miss the beginning of the talk. Um, can you achieve this uh, increase of driver dynamically in the sense that some drivers eventually will come back, will drop a passenger and come back to the pool? So yeah. that's, a, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I want to, like before that, let me emphasize, I, I totally don't see this as uh, that you, you do not want to do prediction or optimization. Uh, the way we are looking at this result is that there, is, there seems to be a huge gain in having a slack in the system. Uh, whether you want to do optimization and prediction on top of that, that's completely possible. Uh, but having a slack is valuable. On your question about uh, dynamic, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very fair question. Here, uh, the drivers are fixed. Uh, and we match passengers show up one by one. We match them one by one. And in, in a sense, when the last passenger shows up, uh, there is only one driver left, whereas in the system, you kind of have a stationary equilibrium that drivers go and come back. Uh, that's exactly one reason that I said at the beginning, this paper is one month old. We are working on that. Uh, my intuition is that that, that that would, if anything, helps greedy, because greedy algorithm here is really being killed in the last few drivers that we match, a few riders that we match, because they are potentially very far from the driver who arrives, uh, whereas uh, the omniscient algorithm is very careful. It knows that I, I should not match this driver to that rider because in future I'm going to have trouble. Uh, but we don't have a formal result, so let me be silent on that. There seems to be a few more questions here. Yash and Afshin, I think, have questions. OK, uh, I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so. Um, in your other paper with Shangu, um, uh, information and um, uh, information and uh, um, thickness in dynamic matching markets, yeah, thickness and information. So the opposite effect happens in the sense that the value of using the right algorithm is more than the value of increasing supply. So if you basically increase supply and keep using the greedy algorithm, you wouldn't gain as much uh, compared to the scenario that you switched the right algorithm. And I'm wondering what are the assumptions that you know make this difference? And my guess would be frictions. My 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 high level, like just one, my, my high level intuition is that the frictions are really high in that paper, but relatively lower here. Um, there could be other things like one dimensionality, I don't know, but I'm just wondering uh, 
Yeah, how, how, what makes this difference? Great question as, and point, as usual. Afshin has uh, the best points. So if by friction you mean, uh, in that paper, our, we had, I mean, zero one matches. Uh, here we have a uh, spatial setting. If by friction you mean that this is like a much harder matching setting relative to this, because here potentially everyone is a match to everyone. Uh, whereas uh, in, in, in that paper, it was a zero one type of match. If this is by what you mean by friction, I agree with you. I think this is a key crucial difference uh, that exists between the two. Uh, I don't know if you meant something else by friction. Uh, yeah, I just meant that uh, the, the chance that you are compatible to another person there is relatively low compared to the market yeah. size. Yeah. So That's... it's hard to make matches between people there, but easier to make matches between people. Yeah, I totally agree uh, that that's the case. Uh... Yeah, so I have one more uh, thought that I will keep it for the end of the talk. There was one more question. Yash, did you have a question? No, I can continue. No, no, sorry. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So there is there is a, there are a lot of papers. I mean, we've, we've tried to uh, cover uh, most of them in the paper. I'm not going to go through them. I want to emphasize on one thing on the previous work is that uh, uh, despite the fact that we kind of reinvented the wheel, wheel for the balanced market, this case has been extensively studied in transportation literature. Okay, so this case of having an end drivers and end passengers distributed in a spatial space and what is the optimal matching. So the, uh, that has been extensively studied, uh, the case of, uh, the case of uh, unbalanced market uh, we haven't found yet. So let me summarize uh, the findings. Uh, the, the, there is a total cost, the optimal matching algorithm uh, has some total cost, which depends on the details of the model. It depends on what is the weighting cost. It depends on the, 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 the like adversarial versus random arrival and so on. Omniscient algorithm is independent of all of those, better than optimum lower cost, and we proved its root n of the order, root n. The omniscient in unbalanced situation is a constant cost. And the greedy in unbalanced is at most uh, order log 3n. And that's, that's basically uh, the summary of the theorems I've, I've shown you. Mama, just a clarification. So you saying greedy is close to omniscient in the unbalanced case, but do we know anything on the balanced case, how greedy compares to omniscient? Uh, well, I know it's somewhere here. Uh, that's, that's as much I know. You're gonna do, do we know more? I don't think you have proved anything for, for, for greedy here. We don't know whether greedy close to omniscient is due to unbalancedness or whether it's, uh, it's a general probability based. Yeah, whether it's, uh, whether it's roots and or not. Yeah, the comparison uh, we are especially interested in is omniscient balance, whether greedy unbalanced. But I agree with you, it would be interesting to know whether greedy is also roots n or it's n to power like a half plus some, some, some positive term. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't know, yes. Thanks. So let me show you a couple of things. Go so ahead. I have one quick question. So the way you increase n, right? Uh, you, you, you do it while keeping the, the unit interval fixed. So there is a sense in which that the value of optimally matching kind of goes down because the market becomes so thick. And so, you know, just to understand exactly what's driving this closeness between greedy unbalanced and omniscient, I mean, to what extent that that feature plays a role? Did you think about really kind of increasing the, the, the unit interval as you increase n? Yes, I mean, uh, we can increase it at a rate that's uh, chosen uh, carefully. It, it cannot be like increasing with n linearly. Uh, that in, in order for us to prove this, these results. So what you're saying is right, that uh, the market is getting thicker and thicker. Uh, so uh, in a way, uh, the, the could be that the value of optimal matching is getting less and less. The, the thing that makes me a little bit optimistic that this should not be a point, two things. One of them is the simulations with relatively small market. The other one is that uh, even in this world, the total cost of matching is actually increasing in N at a, 
at a reasonably high rate, even when I'm fixing uh, the interval from 0, 1, as I increase n, I'm increasing the total cost. Uh, I'm increasing pair matching cost. Each matching is costing, the cost of each matching is one over root n. So, the, so what you are criticizing rightfully is that as I increase n, uh, each driver is getting matched to someone who is really close to them. And that is this term here. So on average, each person is matched to someone who has one over root n distance. But in total, I have to multiply this by n because I have n riders, and this would give me a cost of root n. So this is your term that you're totally right, Yanku. Uh, if this was like, uh, yeah, that's that's my answer for for time being. But that's a very, very good point that uh, we should at least have a discussion of that. Thank you. Uh, so let me show you a few simulations. Uh, with 100 riders and 1,000 riders, in fact, we, we have some simulations for 25 riders too. Uh, so here on the x-axis, I have the number of drivers. I'm fixing the number of riders on the left to 100, on the right to 1,000. Uh, on the y-axis, I have the total cost of matching. Uh, the orange curve is the cost of omniscient in balanced market. Uh, the cost of greedy in balanced market is more than the cost of omniscient in the balanced market. It's like somewhere here. It's actually here. Uh, here too, the cost of greedy in the balanced market is more than the cost of omniscient by a, like a respectful percentage. Uh, it's like 30%, I don't know, something like that. Uh, the question I'm, the, the thing I'm showing you here is how many extra driver greedy needs in order to beat omniscient in total cost. Here the answer is four. Here the answer is like 13. With a thousand riders, I need 13 more drivers. And with 25, if I've shown you, the answer is one. So you need 26 riders. Okay. Uh, is it like, are these numbers like, Great results. Should we excited or not? I don't know. I mean, you you should judge, but but this is it is what it is. Now, one question you may ask uh, is that all the theorems are comparing. Let's say the main theorem is comparing fully balanced market with a few more drivers. What if we start from having a little extra slack already built in? And then the question is, what is the value of adding a few more drivers on top of that? Uh, no theoretical results here. But from a simulation, uh, at least we can simulate uh, our model in this world. So this is my omniscient uh, cost with equal number of drivers and passengers. On the x-axis, I have, again, the number of drivers. Let me write this down. The graph should always have uh, axis. And this is the cost of matching. So this is omniscient with equal number of drivers and passengers. As, you, as I increase the number of drivers, uh, the cost of omniscient goes down. Uh, and by the way, in all of this, I'm ignoring the cost that some drivers are not getting matched. Okay, that, that's like outside the objective function. Uh, now the cost of the greedy is also going down. Uh, this is the previous picture. The green curve here is omniscient shifted with four which tells you that even if you start with 105 drivers for omniscient, having four more drivers is enough for the greedy to beat omniscient. Okay, so it's not really a knife edge result of starting exactly at the balanced market. Even if you start with omniscient and 105, greedy and 109 is gonna do better. And this, these two are so much on top of each other that it seems if you start at any point with omniscient, four extra drivers for greedy, is, is equally good. Is, is this picture? But as I said, this is completely simulation. So there is no theorem that can show uh, why, why this is happening, because we already know that the cost of omniscient with a few more is constant. Although uh, one thing to note is that here, the bound that we have for the greedy is that it is at most polylog. Could be that it's actually a constant, I don't know, or, or much smaller than polylog. Uh, so this is an upper bound, and this is an exact bound. So you never know. 
we look at time. Okay, let me state one theorem quickly and then uh, go to a little bit of ideas of the proof. The last theorem I wanna uh, prove is that uh, suppose a passenger shows up, you match them, another passenger shows up, you match them, uh, another passenger shows up, you match them, and then a passenger shows up who is really far from that last remaining drive. Yeah, me. Uh, hey, Nick. So, uh, so this passenger who shows up here is so far from this driver over here that you may decide not to match them. So far, I didn't allow you to do that. Suppose I allow you to do that. I'm gonna allow the omniscient to avoid matching this guy and pay a penalty B. Okay. If it's really far, you may, you may actually say, okay, I'm not gonna match you. I mean, you're gonna hate lift, but you're also pretty far. Uh, as a result, the optimization problem you're gonna solve is this optimization problem, the usual distance tasks for the omniscient plus a penalty for those people that you do not match. It turns out to be the case that, I mean, of course, this V cannot be too small because then you will decide not to match anyone. If V is zero, then of course, you're gonna match no one. So we are gonna impose a bound. In fact, if V is less than this number over here, then you prefer to match no one, okay, to matching everyone. So we're gonna assume V is uh, more than this object over here to not have this, this, this uh, weird case. Then if V is more than the length of the interval, the result is obvious. You still wanna match everyone because like matching anyone is better than not matching and the same result goes through. If V is between this bound, it's not too small, but it's relatively small as N goes to infinity. This is, this is a very small number uh, to one uh, in this interval then there exists a constant such that, again, the cost of the omniscient is actually not polylog, it's polynomial. It's, it's like, it's n to power delta. Okay, and if delta is exactly one over half, uh, then uh, this, this becomes exactly the previous bound. And if delta is uh, very small, then this becomes very small because, uh, Anyways, so this is saying that uh, even if I, if I allow you not to match some people who are really far, still the cost of the omniscient algorithm is going to be something that's, that's, uh, that's not uh, logarithmic. In fact, it's, it's polynomial, okay? Uh, that's just to say that it's, it's not about outliers, what's happening. It's really about the fact that there are some people, uh, some people, uh, who are far and you still want to match them. Okay, some results, some remarks, and then I will tell you a little bit about ideas of the proof. Our results do not imply that optimization and prediction is not important. Uh, it's, it's about the value of a slack uh, that, that you want to have in your system, probably. And uh, this is a quote from Lyft. Uh, Uber has the same quote on their website. Dynamic pricing is the main technology that allows us to maintain market balance in real time. If by market balance, they mean supply equal to demand, maybe they don't mean that. My guess is that they do. In fact, uh, 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 co-author Amin is, is, has done a lot of uh, amazing algorithmic and uh, pricing works in, in Uber. And that was his interpretation that if this is what they are doing, that they are balancing the market, it seems that that's... that's so related, not... Sorry, related to that question, I was hmm. curious about what the value will be to avoid excess demand. So instead of starting from balanced market, you could then uh, start from unbalanced market with the excess demand and ask what the value of uh, reducing that excess demand. Um, so it could make sense to actually restore balance in this relative to that. Uh, you could do much better even if you could create even more excess supply. That's a very good question. Uh, it's uh, yeah. The qu the question in that world is about the, so if I have more more riders, I have to model the cost of not matching a rider uh, in a way. Uh, and once you do that, uh, then you're totally right. Uh, but that is. Cool. So let me tell you a little bit about proof ideas. Uh, uh, 
And in addition to uh, the modeling and a lot of the framing and so on that I learned from my co-authors and Yagane in particular, and Amin and Chengu, this is the part that I learned a lot from uh, Yagane, who is uh, uh, one of the best mathematicians on the Stanford campus, uh, as well as one of the best uh, creative modelers. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea of the proof. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to show you an idea of the proof of the, of the uh, greedy bit unbalanced. The omniscient has been studied, the balanced omniscient in the, in the transportation literature. The greedy unbalanced is kind of the most uh, like challenging proof, if you like. Uh, so the idea is this. Uh, it, has, it has three steps. The first step is that you have this interval. You, we're going to break the interval into small slices. I will tell you how these slices are built. Uh, and then each slice is going to have log n drivers in it. Uh, and it's going to have one more driver than passenger. Okay, I'm in an unbalanced world, uh, world. I can afford it to have more driver than passengers. Then uh, once I have these slices, uh, I'm going to show that the length of the maximum slice is with high probability this object here, order log squared n over n. And uh, as measured by the number of riders in that slice, length meaning. Oh, it, no, it just means actually a spatial length. So my total slice is uh, one. The size of the uh, interval is one. Sorry. This, yeah. is, this is literally the physical. Uh, and then uh, we are going to show uh, that each rider uh, is matched within uh, order log n slices. So you are matched either to someone in your own slice or someone who is order log n slices away. Note that if I mix these two, I will get the bound that I want, right? The size of the maximum slice is this you are matched to someone who is maximum log n away from that. If I multiply these two, I will get this, that each driver is, each rider is matched to someone with this distance. And then if I multiply this by n, which is the total number of riders, riders I get the bound of order log three, log cube n. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can uh, tell you a little bit more. Uh, so how, how do we construct these slices? It's, it's, a, it's a random walk uh, down spatial markets. Uh, so you start, uh, you have this, we have this picture, right? You have like epsilon n more drivers. I, I, we start from the very left side of this interval at point zero. Uh, the random walk it is at zero. And whenever I see a, right, a, a, a driver, I go up. Whenever I see a rider, I go down. Okay, so I see a driver here, I go up. I see a rider here, I go down, and I continue like this. Okay, and between any of them, I'm just fixed. Okay, so at the end, I'm epsilon n uh, above zero because I have epsilon n more drivers. So the slices are gonna be built like this. Uh, uh, I'm going to look at points that I call them escape points. So my random walk has a bunch of levels. Level zero is the level I start. Level one is the level that I'm one above. Level two is the level that I'm two above. Uh, potentially, I could have even minus one, but here I don't. Uh, so there is a last point that I hit level zero, and I escape from that. I never come back. It's this point. Okay. There is a last point I hit level one, and I never come back. Uh, this is level one, and there is a last point I hit level two, and I never come back. I don't have this last point for level three and four because I actually come back. In general, I have epsilon n uh, plus one of these last points. Okay, I'm going to construct the slices then in this way. Okay, these are my slices. I start from the first point to the first breaking point of zero. Uh, everything here is, is my slice one. Everything between break point, uh, escape point one and two is a slice two. Everything between escape point three and two is a slice three. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's like a random walk, uh, well-defined. If you give me the location of drivers and passengers, I can construct these slices. 
And except for the first slice, in all other slices, I have one more driver than passenger. You can actually show that uh, because of the, uh, the way I've con we've constructed these slices. Right? This is level one to level two. By construction, the number of steps I go up and I go down is such that there is one more driver than passenger. Okay, these are the slices. Perfect. That is the construction of slices. Uh, let me try to uh, now. How do we, how do you prove that uh, these slices have log n drivers in each one of them? Uh, the fact that each one has more drivers by was by construction. It's just algebra. You write down the the distribution of the number of drivers in each number of riders in each slice. It has this this form of distribution. And from this, this you can actually prove that the or the number of riders in each slice is order log n. I actually don't. We don't need this now for the greedy. We we, we need this especially for the omniscient in unbalanced. So let me continue. The length of maximum slice is order log squared n over n. Uh, this one just uses the observation that for n uniform random points in zero one, the maximum distance between two consecutive points is order log n over n. Uh, and uh, I have maximum log n riders, so the length of the maximum slice is going to be uh, maximum log n squared over n. Uh, and the last step, which is the kind of the trickiest step, uh, which I could never prove uh, if it wasn't for Yagane, is that uh, each rider is matched within order log n slices. Okay. So you are either matched to someone in your own slice or someone who is not too far from. How you prove that? Uh, so, I'm, so here's the, here's the idea. You have these drivers. Create these quote unquote segments. Okay, these segments are independent of riders at this point. They are defined between the intervals between drivers. Now a passenger shows up. I match this passenger to the closest driver. It's a greedy algorithm. So nothing happens here. Once I match a passenger to a driver, which is in a different segment, I'm gonna merge these two segments. Another passenger shows up. Uh, look at this right side. Two passengers shows up, show up. I match them to these two. As a result, these two segments merge. Okay, so that is how you uh, create this merged segments. Uh, now, in any segment that I have here, all drivers except the endpoints are matched. By construction of each segment, you're matching every driver inside the segment. And the only drivers that are not matched potentially are the drivers who are at the endpoint. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to prove that each segment has order log n uh, slices, which means that each rider is matched within order log n slices. That's what I want to prove. I want to prove that you're matched. Uh, within order log in slices, I know you are matched with someone in your segment. That's how I construct it. Everyone is matched with someone in their own segment. That is the construction of segments. So if I prove that each segment has maximum order log in slices, uh, we are done with the proof. And this proof uh, works like this, uh, that suppose I have a segment. Uh, and this segment has a bunch of slices in it, uh, plus a bunch of slices that actually intersect with the end of the segment potential. Now I have one more driver here, one more driver here, one more driver here, and all of that. And I know that in each segment, in total, I have at most two excess drivers. Okay, so all extra drivers that I have inside these interior slices should be matched to passengers who are here in these areas. Okay. So if I have k slices, uh, all uh, I have k extra drivers, k interior slices, I have k extra drivers, and all of them should be matched with, 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 the, with the riders here. Well, I already know that I have maximum order log n uh, riders in each slice. So I have maximum order log n slices here in this corner and here in this corner. 
the number of riders I have cannot be more than order log n, which means I cannot have more than order log n slices in between here, right? Because if I have k slices here, all of them should be matched to people here, to the riders here. Well, I have maximum, say, 10 riders here and 10 riders here, too many, so I cannot have more than 20 slices in between. Which proves uh, that uh, you cannot have more than in, more than k log n interior slices. Uh, so this segmentation is the key uh, to the proof. And here uh, we close the proof. Uh, let me close uh, by actually I'm not going to show you the proof of the balance case. Thank you. We can take a few questions. Thanks, my madam. Um, so, are there any questions, um, additional questions? So, there were some questions in the chat which were mainly about the uh, and you know, the size of the imbalance that you're allowing, which is like uh, linear in N. So, um, the difference between the number of drivers and the number of passengers um, is linear in N. So I think the questions were about uh, what happens if uh, you know, this is sublinear in N or constant in terms of uh, comparison between omniscient and greedy. I think some, yeah. It's what if it's not a constant? I missed it. What is so what if it's not? Uh, so your imbalanceness, the difference between uh, um, number of uh, of riders and number of drivers is, is linear in n, right? It's epsilon times n. So yeah. the question were about what happens if this is if the difference is a constant, for instance, you know, yes, yes. n, or if it's sublinear sub in n, and what happens in terms of the comparison between greedy and and, uh, and omniscience? I think, yeah. Well, with, with constant, if it's epsilon additive more drivers, this definitely theoretical result will not go through. Yeah. Uh, whether for extra drivers between root and by uh, theoretical results, or you mean the comparison between? So you mean the the order of magnitude of the, for the cost for the omniscient? You don't talk about. You're not talking about the difference between greedy and omniscient. Both of them. So both, both, of them could... both results that that exist for unbalancedness. Uh, this is for greedy and for omniscient. It's just a constant. It requires a proportional extra drivers. Now, Yegon, you can help me with that, whether if it's between root n, so this is now uh, epsilon n extra drivers, uh, whether like epsilon n to power a half uh, plus epsilon, basically a little bit more than root n proportional is enough. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I'm... Yeah, uh, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, we, yes. don't have, we don't have a result, but that's, that's our guess, my guess. That, uh, yeah, it's, it should be sublinear. Yeah, the guess is that uh, n plus epsilon doesn't work, n times one plus epsilon does work, and probably something that is like more than epsilon root and extra driver works, but there is no theorems. Thank you, Elon. Uh, Twitter, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, um, I think thanks. Are there any other questions? Thanks everyone for the comments. Yep. It's a new uh, project and we are learning a lot as we go. So. Thanks a lot, Mohamed, for a nice presentation. And so, yeah, we're going to move to uh, the next talk. And uh, Afshin, I think, is the next, next speaker. So, uh, Afshin, you can share your slide. Okay. Slides. Um, so, are my slides visible? Do you see them move now? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Shin. So you have yeah again fifty five minutes. Um, sure. Uh, question from uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks for organizing this beautiful workshop. I'm gonna tell you about uh, optimal dynamic allocation, simplicity through information design. 
and this is a joint work with uh, Itai Schlage and an amazing student in the Stanford, Fred Ramanaho, who will also be uh, helping uh, answering the questions today. Okay, um, so this is about um, non-monetary markets to which objects and unit demand agents arrive over time. And agents wait to get their preferred objects. Think about, for example, public housing in New York City. Like, so there are these uh, affordable houses made by the government. People who need them can wait on a wait list to be given a chance of moving in to one of these houses. Refugee resettlements, refugees wait to be um, assigned to locations or cities that can host them. Or wait list in Oregon allocation. There are 100,000 patients on a wait list uh, in the US, for example, waiting for disease donor uh, kidneys that are made available over time and are offered to these patients who can you know, accept the offers or wait for a more preferred option. Now, a general question that comes up in these applications is that how long each agent should wait and what should she get? Uh, this question has been studied in the literature before. There are work that have tackled this question. In the next slide, I'm going to tell you a little about uh, some of these work. Uh, and I'm mostly going to focus on um, work that consider heterogeneous agents or heterogeneous objects. I have a more complete related work slide later. I will talk about a bigger list of work, including a beautiful paper by Junko and Olivier that we will hear about tomorrow. But in the next slide, I'm going to focus on the trade-off between allocative efficiency and waiting costs. So what is this trade-off? Well, you can wait, you can make the market thicker and make better matches, but that also, incur that also means you incur waiting costs. So there, there, there's a trade-off involved. And uh, there, uh, there are two groups of work that generally uh, study these trade-off. The first group, focus on special classes of mechanisms and optimize over special classes of mechanisms or show their equivalence. The second group consider uh, general mechanisms, but they make an observability assumption. So for example, they assume that agents types or compatibilities are observable. Um, so what distinguishes this work from the previous ones is that we study optimal allocation mechanisms in large markets where there are multiple objects and agents. We make uh, the assumption that agent types are unobservable. So we take a mechanism design perspective and we optimize over all direct revelation methods. Uh, so what does optimization mean? We, the objective is social welfare. I'm gonna define it carefully later, but basically these are the two main distinguishing points here. So what kind of questions do we answer? Who waits how long, uh, gets what in the welfare maximizing solution, and how to implement the solution. Okay, so let me be more precise. Uh, I'm going to be uh, starting from the setup. Then I'm going to tell you the findings. Uh, some, uh, if I have time, something about the proof outline, and then some counterpart results for discrete markets, uh, and at the end, some simulations. Okay. So the setup is uh, gonna be a continuum setup, uh, the setup that I start with. So agents arrive to a pool with a flow rate of one. And later on in discrete markets, we are gonna switch to Poisson processes, but for now it's simpler to stick to this continuum model. So agents arrive to the pool with a flow rate of one and agents type is drawn from some distribution um, G with uh, support over some interval objects arrive similarly to the pool, but with a flow rate less than one. So um, this is an over-demanded market. There is not enough objects for everyone. And an object type is drawn IID from some distribution F with finite support. So these are the possible object types, omega one to omega n. And I also assume that there is a, an object type omega naught that uh, is of the lowest type and is an abandoned supply. We can think of this as the outside option. So everybody can claim this with no cost. So what are, how, how utilities are defined. Um, so the utility that an agent 
of type theta gets from being assigned to an object of type omega is defined by this utility function u of theta. And we make another assumption here that um, if agent faces a lottery over objects such that the mean object type is in that lottery is omega bar, then the utility that the agent assigns to that lottery is u of theta and omega bar. So essentially, all the agent cares about the, um, in the lottery is the mean object type. So this is, if you may, for example, is an assumption similar to Greshkov et al. or uh, Dvorak and Martini. And here are the assumptions we make on U. U is supermodular, so that means higher type agents appreciate quality more. And this next one, U1 is convex in omega. This is a technical assumption. Uh, we are gonna see its role later in the proof outline. But if I want to say it briefly, this is gonna help us ensure that a certain optimization problem has an extreme point solution. Um, one example of a function that satisfies these assumptions is, you know, the good old separable utility function, u of theta omega is just equal theta times omega. So it's a special case of what we consider. Uh, agents incur a weighting cost while waiting, and that cost is uh, for cost for waiting t units of time is just c of t. Um, we assume for now, until further notice, that c is an increasing function. The agent's payoff is her utility minus her waiting cost. So how much you get from the object minus how much you how much cost you incur from waiting. And the social welfare is the average of agents' payoffs. So in the paper, we allow for arbitrary weighted averages, but here for simplicity, I'm gonna stick to simple average. So we assume that an agent's type theta is private. Uh, it's uh, observable uh, only to herself. And um, we take a mechanism design perspective. So a mechanism M elicits every agent's type and assigns her an allocation plan. What is that? What is an allocation plan? That's giant, just a joint probability distribution over times of allocation and the types of objects. For example, it says, one month from now, you are gonna get an object of quality five uh, with probability half. Two months from now, you're gonna get an object of type uh, uh, 12 with probability one thirds and so on. Okay. And the type of mechanisms that we focus on are um, you know, the standard mechanisms, incentive compatible, individually rational and steady state mechanisms. Um, for uh, incentive compatibility, the definition is as usual, an agent's payoff is maximized when she reports her type truthfully to the mechanism. And individual rationality is that the payoff of an agent of type theta is at least equal to claiming her outside option as no cost. So you have theta and omega naught. And the steady state assumption in the continuum model is that the composition of the pool remains the same across them. In the discrete setup, that which we will get to later, this is of course not the case, but here in the continuum model, this is the steady state assumption. And the question we ask is, which, of, which mechanism among, among this class um, attains the highest social wealth? Option? Yes. Just to clarify, can the mechanism depend on the time of entry of the agent? Uh, so uh, it, uh, the mechanism uh, takes agents types and assigns them an allocation plan. So by what I have said so far, the mechanism can only condition on the agents types. However, it turns out things like, um, let's um, wait if an agent arrives at time X, let's wait, ask him later about our type. This is not gonna change anything. So basically optimal mechanisms are just gonna ask agents type upon their arrival and they are gonna assign them an allocation plan based on their type. Okay. So now I can, um, tell you about optimal mechanisms in the setup. And um, for that, I need to define the class of monotone disjoint queue mechanisms. The optimal mechanism is gonna belong to this class. 
So, uh, and it's better to, uh, it's for, for, for ease of exposition, it's better to stick to a queuing representation. That's what I'm gonna use in this picture here. So there are three queues in this mechanism. I mean, in this picture, in general, there's a, there are a finite number of queues in the mechanism. Um, how does uh, the mechanism assign objects to queues? So here I have listed all of object types. There are intervals that partition the space of object types. Um, it is possible that two of these intervals at the end point uh, would collide with uh, one, one object type. But that is a possibility. I'm going to talk about it soon. But otherwise, uh, uh, this is a partition. Uh, so the highest interval is going to be sent to the highest key. The next highest interval is going to be sent to the next queue, and so on. If there is an object in the middle, it is possible that some, with some rate, the object is sent to the higher queue, and with some other rate, the object is sent to the lower queue. So this is how objects are allocated across queues. How do agents choose uh, which queue to join? Agents arrive. They compute their expected waiting time at each queue. They can also observe the expected object type that they will be allocated if they uh, go to that queue. So they join the queue that maximizes their expected payoff. And let's say they join this queue. They wait in the queue until it's their turn. Uh, the queue is a first come first serve queue. Agents cannot decline objects. So when an agent gets an object, um, the assignment is final. She gets it. She departs the queue. So this is something that we call a monotone disjoint queue mechanism. And the theorem is that the optimal mechanism is a monotone disjoint queue mechanism. Let me pause here. If there are questions about, about this theorem. And the agent would join the queue as soon as they arrive. They immediately join at least one queue as soon as they arrive. Yeah, it is in there. Uh, it, it is basically optimal for them to join their favorite queue as soon as they are. Okay. So uh, yes. Here, it seems like it would be without loss of generality to say they cannot decline the assignment because if it's IR and you decline, I can just promise to not assign you anything ever again. And whatever I was assigning you was already IR. So it would be better for you to take it. So it is true, but you know, the type of uh, commitment power that we usually assume in mechanism design, um, um, just almost by definition, essentially by definition, agents cannot decline assignments, right? You can't, if you, if you are using a mechanism, you can't say no to what the mechanism assigns you. Uh, but um, in, later on, we will observe that, you know, many wait lists in practice do not feature this property. They allow agents to say no. And we are motivated by that. We are going to get to the second result. But um, but but th yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, but I guess this is why I was asking about the timing earlier. Is if if for example I can't distinguish a new arrival versus someone I assigned and rejected a, an offer, um, should I treat them the same going forward or? So they they can. I mean in this. In this mechanism, nobody can reject offers. Just by definition of the mechanism, people uh, are going to get what they are assigned. So, uh, okay, that's that's basically in the realm of the mechanism design literature. We assume that people take what they are assigned by the mechanism. Um, I, I guess that what Teddy was uh, after was really what kind of a real world setting will support that assumption, right? So, given that the people do have choices. Very good. Right? So, Very so that good. means that I think that you know you do you are able to distinguish these two groups of people. This is what you're assuming in principle. Very good. I agree that you know in practice, this is not necessarily true that people will get what they are assigned, and that's exactly why we get to the second part: implementation using a framework that, in fact, allows people to decline offers. Um, so before I get there, just I'm uh, sorry, but yes. but still, you are assuming that you know you can distinguish people who are rejected and come back, right, from people who are actually new arrivals. Okay, so in the current set, in this 
in this mechanism design framework, uh, it is assumed that everybody uh, accept offers. If somebody doesn't accept an offer, um, yeah, you can assume that you can distinguish them and you will not assign anything to them. And that means the mechanism, uh, it will be individually rational to take offers, to take, to, 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 to take offers that are made to you. That exactly. is a good point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thanks for the clarification. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, a couple of remarks before I move to the other, uh, to the, to, to the other result about the optimal mechanism. Assortative mechanisms are not necessarily optimal. So what are assortative mechanisms? These are mechanisms that would say, let's assign the highest um, object type to the highest agents, and then the next highest object type to the next highest agents and so on. And why are they necessarily optimal? The intuition is that um, agents do not internalize the cost of the cost that waiting has on others. So think about highest agent types, their incentives to get assigned to the highest object type is more than others, um, right? And this derives the price for uh, the highest object type above the socially optimum. So what does the optimal mechanism do if I wanna say in one sentence is that it trades off the loss from misallocation and gains from reduced waiting costs optimal. So there, within each queue, there is some loss from uh, loss in allocative efficiency, uh, but it helps to reduce the prices of, uh, uh, of really high type objects. And essentially the mechanism should uh, get to the sweet spot in this trade-off to be optimal. I'll tell you more about this in the proof part. Okay, so um, let me get to the next result and then, uh, uh, and, and then to the proof part. So the next result is, as we discussed, is uh, motivated by the observation that in practice, many waitlist allow agents to be selective. If you don't want an object, then say no, and that's fine. Um, so uh, we are gonna, um, here we are gonna allow declines. Um, uh, and we are gonna, the result says that allowing for declines is possible without any loss in social welfare. If the planner can design the information disclosed to agents about objects. So if the planner can control the type of information shown to agents about objects, then we can implement the same outcome, but in a framework that allows agents to decline. Okay. Now let me a bit more specific. I will start by defining an information disclosure policy. So what is that? Uh, so a disclosure policy mu for an arriving uh, object omega draws a, a signal from a distribution. And this distribution can depend uh, on the object type. Uh, what is important is that this distribution is the same, uh, sorry, the signal realization is the same for every agent. So the same realization is revealed to all agents. And um, the distributions are common knowledge. So this is the, the definition of an information disclosure policy. What is the allocation mechanism that we are gonna uh, use? That's gonna be a simple mechanism. First come first serve wait list with deferrals under some information disclosure policy. So what does that mean? Let me show you with a picture. Suppose people are waiting on a, in a lot and object becomes available. There is this um, uh, information disclosure policy mu, a signal will be drawn from, from the disclosure policy. And the signal realization will be um, shown to the first agent. If she takes the, uh, the offer, if she accepts it, that's great. We can move on. Uh, the assignment is final and we can move. If she says no, uh, this will be offered to the next agent, okay, and so on. So this is the definition of a first come first survey list with deferrals under information disclosure policy. But because this is an important assumption, uh, I should pause here for questions. Uh, because this is an important definition, I should pause here for questions. So I guess uh, I'll 
Yes. What happens, sorry. What happens to the Asian who just deferred? Do they go to the back of the line or no, they, just... they don't lose they don't lose position? Okay, so to get to the theorem, I need to define the special class of mechan uh, information disclosure policies. We say uh, an information disclosure policy mu pulls adjacent object types. If it uses intervals to partition the interval of object types. And rather than uh, revealing the exact object type, it will only reveal the interval that contains the object. So th there will be uh, similarly monotonic partitions that break down uh, the uh, interval of object types. And for each object type, rather than revealing its exact type, the designer will just say the object type is between X and Y. Okay, so this is the type of information disclosure policy that we are going to use in the theorem. And the theorem says there exists such an information disclosure policy under which first come first serve waitlist with deferrals attains the same social welfare as the mechanism that we saw earlier. So attains the second best social welfare essentially. Any questions about this, Tara? I guess one thing that is a bit unclear, I mean, this is not totally clarifying question. So if you don't want, you don't have to answer, but um, the, I, I'm a little bit unclear about why first come first serve is so good. It, it usually has an effect of, you know, creating these negative externalities that people do ignore and therefore Often people, say, you know, when say, you know, when to say that something like last come for serve with a replacement or, or preemption could um, solve, you know, fix the problem. Here, I guess the issue is the negative externalities that, you know, I guess competition for the better, better objects, right? So, uh, I mean, can't you, don't, aren't you able to manage better that issue better by switching to a different? Uh, queuing discipline, which will in turn allow you to get closer to our sort of matching. Um, so if we are shooting for the second best, we are attaining it here by using the right information disclosure policy. Are your, are, is your question that, about? That's exactly what I was asking. So I, I, I hear, I see that as the claim. I was just not I was I kind of confused about, you know, the-, the, the About the why this happened. Yeah, desirability of first come, first serve, yeah. Okay, so, okay, let me actually say a couple more words about this uh, and then go back to your question. Hope that clarifies. Uh, so the intervals that we are talking here uh, that uh, partition the object types turn out to be actually um, exactly the intervals that we have in the monotone disjoint queue mechanism. So for each object type, the planner is gonna reveal the interval con containing. The proof, however, for the theorem is different than the monotone disjoint queue mechanism. And the reason is that people's decisions in the first come first survey to with deferral depends on the decisions of others ahead of them. So if people are playing a game and we should show that there is a unique equilibrium and the welfare under that equilibrium is the same as the one that we achieve in the uh, disjoint queue mechanism. Uh, so why, if I wanna uh, answer your question, a short answer could be the reason that first come first serve becomes optimal is that, um, sorry, let me, is that um, basically um, we are reducing the price for the highly desired object by pooling them with less desired objects. So that helps in uh, attaining efficiency. Why last come first serve cannot beat this? Um, so we, will deal, we, we need to deal with incentive problems in last come first. Um, so there are incentive problems and there are, um, uh, uh, so, so, so almost by definition, so, okay, if I, the, the formal answer is that um, there's a unique outcome. Uh, that then the second best social welfare. And uh, 
first come first, uh, last come first cannot implement that outcome because pri because waiting costs are uh, should be zero in last come first serve in a continuum model. So this is a very compact answer, uh, but um, but but um, yeah, maybe just let me. Um, um, I got got gotcha. you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. 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 So, all right. So I have told you um, the two results. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Uh, I think I have about 25 minutes left. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So let me go. Yeah. Uh, let me go over the uh, uh, proof outline and then very briefly some results about discrete markets. Um, Okay, so what is the proof approach? Um, as far as we know, classic ironing techniques are not directly applicable here. And that is because uh, of the concurrence of two complicating factors. First, there are multiple object types with each with finite capacities, if you may. And the second one is the supermodularity of the utility function. Um, so what we do in the proof is that we take a different approach. We use the extreme point characterization results of Clay and Aretau, which is uh, a beautiful paper. Uh, and, um, um, and, and so we build on this and prove the optimality of this joint queue mechanism. So let me define a couple of preliminaries and then uh, give you a high level outline of the proof. For two functions, X and Y, from the type space, agents type space, uh, to real numbers, we say X majorizes Y if these two inequalities hold. The first one is just saying that the mass that Y assigns to agents of type above theta is at most the mass that X assigns to them for any theta. And the second one says that the total mass that Y assigns to every agent from the lowest type to the highest type should be equal to the mass that X assigns. If the first inequality holds, but the second one doesn't hold, we say that e, v, uh, X weakly majorizes. But when both of them hold, we say, simply say that X majorizes. Any questions about uh, the definition? Okay. So uh, one no, other notion that we need for the proof is you know, a well-known notion in mechanism design. We need to define the notion of interim allocation rule X. So uh, uh, for a mechanism, we say it's interim allocation rule X theta is the expected object time type that is assigned to an agent of type theta. Mm, uh, to find the optimal mechanism, we use classic uh, uh, approaches to transform the problem to a virtual surplus maximization problem. So we are choosing X here. So we are maximizing over all allocation. Uh, that all allocation rules, I, I mean the set of interim allocation rules of all incentive compatible individual rational and steady state. So we, we are maximizing over such X. And the objective we are maximizing is um, virtual surplus. And virtual surplus is defined somewhat as usual here. Uh, so if it helps, uh, think of the separable case when U is equal to theta X, this U1 will be replaced just by X. So we want to solve this problem. And to solve this problem, we make two observations. Um, the first one is that the integral functional here is, a, is convex in X. And this is due to the convexity assumption that we made earlier, pointwise convexity. The second observation, uh, we are gonna prove it later, but we will show that S is convex, S is a convex set. And these two observations, together with the bar's maximum principle, will um, imply that the optimal X will be an extreme point of S. So if we want to characterize optimal X, we can think about characterizing S and the set of its extreme points. And um, to characterize S, um, I should first define this um, allocation rule that I call the positive assortative assignment or XP. So what is that? That just assigns uh, highest type agents 
to highest type objects. So in this example, we have two types of objects. XP says, let's assign the highest type of object to the highest type of agents until there is no more of it left. At that point, we switch to the next highest type, um, right, omega one. We assign it until there is more, no more of it left. The market is over demanded. So some agents at the end will be assigned to their outside option. So this is the definition of XP, the positive assortative assignment. Um, any, any questions about this definition? Okay. So we show that S, the set S that we talked about earlier is the set of all monotone functions that are weakly majorized by XP. So if you want to think about interim allocation rules of incentive compatible mechanisms, instead you can think about the sort of all monotone Y that are weakly majorized by XP. And furthermore, we show that at an extreme point of S where social welfare is maximized, the majorization is strict, it is not weak. That simply says that the allocation rule is non wasteful it uses every object. And here is where the beautiful results of Kleiner et al. come into picture. So uh, they generally characterize the set of extreme points of a set S defined by any function, not, uh, not necessarily XP as uh, uh, we do here, but so we, we, we here we are dealing with a special function XP and their results uh, say that um, every extreme point X star coincides with XP, except over a countable subset of intervals. So if you want to think about the set of extreme points of S, like X star, the result says that except for a countable subset of intervals, X star and XP are gonna be the same. But what happens in those countable subsets of intervals? Suppose, for example, there is one such interval where X star and XP are not the same. The results say that here, X star is just going to be the average of XP over the center. So remove all the black lines from X, XP, replace them with their average, that will become X. So I've seen one yes. quick question. Um, the, the reason that you, you define capital S to be the set of all monotone weakly measurable, I mean, why that it's weakly measurized by XP, uh, that's coming from feasibility, right? My question, I, I'm wondering why weekly rather than uh, just me simply measurized? Um, so because of nano assignment? Uh, uh, some mechanisms, um, some mechanisms, some some incentive compatible mechanisms can be based, right? So we are we have to if we want to prove the theorem, we basically we we are in addition proving that mechanisms True. are not so based. that's what I was uh, yeah asking you right so yeah. because of the nano Simon possibility for some exactly purposes. sorry yeah. Yes. Yeah. I missed that yes okay so yeah there is all says that except for an inter uh, countable subset of intervals we are gonna have um, uh, the same allocation uh, as um, XP over those countable subsets of intervals we are gonna have a, a flat line and because the number of object types are finite, we are only, only the, the, what X star is gonna look like is basically uh, 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 something like this with a finite number of jumps, right? And each flat uh, line here will correspond to a Q. So each of these lines, this will be Q2, this will be Q1, and this will be Q0. Okay? So that's how the disjoint Qs are created. Any questions here? Okay. Um, so let me uh, try to tell you a little bit about discrete markets. Um, so uh, in discrete markets, agents and objects arrive according to Poisson processes with rates lambda and lambda. So lambda is just a scaling parameter. When we increase, we, we say we grow, uh, we, we let the market grow large by in, uh, when we increase lambda. Uh, N is uh, always less than N, that means the market is over demanded. So uh, this mimics the continuum setup. 
One difference here is that the allocation timeline that a mechanism assigns to people can depend on the state of the pool, right? In general, now the mechanism can condition on who are in the pool and how long they have waited. Um, we assume a linear waiting cost function. So this is uh, the first restriction aside monotonicity that we make. So there is this constant gamma. We assume that waiting cost is linear. Um, this, uh, I conjecture that is not an uh, important assumption when the waiting cost is con con concave or even convex with sufficiently small derivatives, it shouldn't be a problem as suggested by simulations, but uh, the results we can prove are only for linear. Um, all else is the same as in the continuum model. The question is what is the incentive compatible individually rational and steady state mechanism with the highest social? And the answer is pretty natural. All we need to do is really just adapting the mechanism that we saw in the continuum setup to the discrete set. How does that happen? Um, so uh, think about the continuum setup. Objects were sent to queues according to constant rates. Here, we just need to replace these rates with probabilities. And these probabilities are going to be proportional to the rate. So, um, so an object in the discrete setup is sent to a queue with probability proportional to the arrival rate to that queue in the continuum. If I, if I want to uh, show you an expression, suppose these are arrival rates of objects of type omega to qi in the continuum model. Um, in the discrete setup, an object of type omega is sent to qi with this probability. So the probability is just proportional to the rate of arrival in the continuum. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, and so here is the theorem. As lambda grows large, as, uh, as the market grows large, the social welfare under the adapted mechanism in the discrete setup approaches the second best. The second best that we can have in the in the discrete. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, it's not obvious to me what the definition of a steady state mechanism is in the environment that you are looking at now. Could you? Yeah. Thank you. A bit more? Yeah. So basically, um, it uh, uh, yeah I, I dropped this definition, but basically, uh, it is a classic. It's a classic definition that we use uh, in stochastic processes. It and it's boiled down to being some time averages uh, being well defined. So the limit of a time average uh, exists. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, the theorem doesn't. The theorem doesn't say anything about convergence rate. Right. Uh, it just says that it approaches the second best. And we do some simulations to show how fast the convergence rate is. And it's uh, uh, surprising to me. Um, and we can't really mm, prove this theoretically yet, uh, anything about convergence rate, but the, but the simulation suggests that the convergence is pretty fast. So here um, for lambda, we vary lambda from one to 10. Um, the, there are two queues in the market. Uh, the average object type arriving to the first queue equals one and to the second queue equals two. We assume that the utility function is separable. Um, agent types are drawn from the uniform distribution. Market is over demanded and waiting costs are linear. What we do here is for each lambda, for each market size, so this is the market size uh, to which uh, um, agents arrive with, type, with uh, a Poisson rate of six. Right? So for each uh, agent type, we run the disjoint queue mechanism until 100 million agents arrive. And we compute the average social welfare. And we see that, um, so the, the curvy line is for the discrete setup and the solid line is for the, from the continuum model. So this is, this solid line is constant because it corresponds to the continuum model. There, if you scale the market, not social welfare wouldn't change. We see that convergence in social welfare happens pretty quickly. Um, and the same for fading costs. So the prices of these objects, if you may, converge quickly in the discrete setup to those prices in the continuum. 
Okay, so let me see how much of your time I have. I think 10 minutes. So I will briefly go over this part. The proof for this relies on a concentration bound. And this um, uh, concentration bound, um, I'll, I'll tell you what the concentration bound is, but the bound is also uh, uh, based on the results uh, of a very nice paper by Ashlag, Ilesh, Chian, and Saberi. Um, so let me tell you what the bound is. Uh, in words, it says that the length of a Q in the discrete model is concentrated around its length in the continuum. So what does it mean? Let me be a bit more precise and tell you about this in simulations. So here we are scaling lambda uh, in an exponential way. So lambda is 10 times two to the P and P um, varies from one to 12. For each lambda, we again run the market until hundred million agents arrive. And for each of these agents, we compute their waiting cost if they join let's say Q1, okay, so, the, so let's say this is the highest Q. Okay, so uh, uh, we compute the waiting cost of these agents if they join Q1, there will be 100 million waiting costs. So this is an empirical distribution for waiting costs at Q1. And then we pick an interval, this interval will be the one that I'm showing in the picture that contains 95% of these waiting costs in, in the empirical distribution. So the interval excludes the right tail and the left tail symmetrically. And we see that the interval that contains 95% of the waiting cost shrinks very quickly. The length shrinks very quickly as lambda grows large, suggesting that the waiting cost that agents observe when they arrive is pretty much close to the one that they observe in the continuum model um, when lambda grows. Large. So that's, this is basically the gist of the result. This is the most important part of the result. I, I won't have time to go over more of it, um, but uh, I will tell you a little bit about, so what I told you about is a discrete uh, counterpart for the first result that we had in the continuum model, right? For this joint queue mechanism. What about the second result? So let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, recall that and the second result in the continuum setup said that if we pick this information disclosure policy carefully, which should be a policy that uh, pulls adjacent object types, then a first come first survey this with deferrals attains the same social welfare as the optimal mechanism. So now we propose a counterpart for this result in the discrete setup. Uh, what is the counterpart? Again, it's the natural adaptation of the mechanism that we saw, excuse me, in the uh, continuum set. So run the first come first of waitlist with the ferals and then under the same information disclosure policy as in the continuum set. Use this exactly the same intervals. Show to people information according to these intervals. Um, we prove, here, 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 is, uh, here is the statement. We prove that this mechanism attains optimal social welfare if a certain concentration bound akin to the one that I showed you on the plot holds. We cannot prove the concentration bound theoretically. What we do is that we use simulations to demonstrate that it holds. So that, that's the only part of the argument that uses simulations, but we show that if the bound holds, then, um, then, then this adaptation attains the same social welfare um, as in the continuum. Okay. Um, so um, these are difficulties that I talked about earlier. The um, an agent's decision depends on uh, those ahead of uh, ahead of her in the queue. So this is they are going to play a game. Um, we focus on a particular equilibrium of this game, and in this equilibrium, each agent computes the optimal action upon her ar arrival. So I arrive to the queue. I look at uh, every queue. I compute the optimal action upon my arri arrival observing the length of the queues and the decisions of the others, uh, other people in the queue. And then I stick to that action. In this particular equilibrium, I stick to that action. And we show that this behavior induces an epsilon equilibrium for lambda sufficiently large. What is epsilon equilibrium? It means that only a fraction epsilon of agents can benefit from deviating. So if when I arrive, I compute um, my payoff from uh, joining each of the queues, and I stick to that pay. Uh, I, I stick to that strategy forever. 
then the chance that I can improve my payoff by deviating is vanishingly small. So that's the, that's the definition of the epsilon. Um, yeah, so again, to reiterate over the result, uh, we proved that social welfare under this equilibrium approaches the second best as lambda approaches infinity if the concentration bound holds and we use simulations to demonstrate that the bound holds. So as you see, the first, the counterpart for the first result is cleaner than the counterpart for the second result. And the main reason is this game that is being played between the, uh, between the people in the discrete setup in, in the second result. People should care about beliefs of others if they want to optimize, right? And uh, higher order beliefs become important. So, so this is, a, this is uh, admittedly a much harder problem um, for, uh, for analyzing than, than, than the con discrete counterpart um, for disjoint queue mechanisms. Okay, so this is the more comprehensive list that I promised. Uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm running out of time, uh, but let me just briefly mention that uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, there is also uh, literature and mechanism design and costly signaling um, uh, that are theoretically relevant in the case of separable utilities. So the analysis there, um, uh, so, so, so we, we don't follow these approaches, but for the case of separable utilities, the analysis here is theoretically, uh, the ironing techniques here are theoretically uh, relevant here as well. Um, Okay, so let me conclude. Um, welfare maximizing, uh, we, we study um, welfare maximization in a dynamic one-sided market where agents and objects are vertically differentiated. The optimal mechanism is a system of disjoint queues. Uh, allocation of objects to queues is assortative across queues, but random within queues. And uh, agents may choose which queue to join but they cannot decline an assignment once they join the queue. So, and uh, motivated by some uh, wait lists in practice, we do allow agents to decline. We see that uh, the same outcome can be implemented by a first come first serve wait list, uh, which allows agents to decline if the planner can um, control the information disclosed to agents. Uh, and that will be attainable by a disclosure policy that pulls adjacent object types. All right, that's all. Um, so, and let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Afshin. Yeah, we do have time for questions. So, please feel free to ask Yanko. Uh, yeah, I have one. So, one question is more about, you know, modeling choice. Seems that the result will be much more impressive if you allow for continuum of types because my guess is that you still have like maybe, you know, you know, bunching going on all over the places. If, you know, that would be much more interesting if, if you kind of uh, have a pooling, right, of uh, continual types, even though, you know, you could have actually finally right. assigned them. The second uh, is just maybe my, my own confusion, or I, have, I may have missed something. Uh, here it's overloaded system, right? So I don't know, I mean, can I imagine how, I mean, it's, I mean, maybe it's like Georg's question, maybe similar, similar to what Georg was think, might be thinking, but um, so nobody's exiting here. So don't you get accumulation, accumulation of uh, buyers over time? So there is always people who arrive and observe the queue, observe that queues are just too long and they depart immediately. They, they I do. see, that explains, thank you. Yeah, sure. And sure. the first question, um, so about the first question, uh, here, here is the, uh, so I, I believe under some smoothness assumptions on, on the distributions, we should get the same result. And the reason we don't do that here is, is, is um, so these extreme point characterization, um, the, uh, the extreme point of characterization of Kleiner et al., um, like I said, it says there are a countable number of intervals, not a finite number of intervals. So it might be some uh, edge cases for distributions, which there are infinitely many intervals. And uh, that is the main challenge for, the, for, for, for proving the result for, for the uh, continuum distribution, for a continuous distribution. Yeah. 
but under some smoothness assumptions, I, I would imagine that shouldn't happen. Thank you. Thanks. Are there, are there any other questions? No, so let us thank the speaker again. Thanks, Evsin. Thank you. And um, so I think we, yeah, so we're gonna have a social gathering. Uh,